Two, the kindergarten as a place of education. The mother, the best kindergartner in. It is hardly necessary here to discuss the merits of the kindergarten school. The success of such a school demands rare qualities in the teacher, high culture, some knowledge of psychology and of the art of education. Intense sympathy with the children, much tact, much common sense, much common information, much joyousness of nature and much governing power. In a word, the kindergarten method is nicely contrived to bring the child on rapport with a superior intelligence. Given such a superior being to conduct it, the kindergarten is beautiful. Tis like a little heaven below. But put a commonplace woman in charge of such a school and the charmingly devised gifts and games and occupations become so many instruments of wooden teaching. If the very essence of the kindergarten method is personal influence, a sort of spiritual mesmerism, it follows that the mother is naturally the best kindergartnerin for who so likely as she to have the needful tact, sympathy, common sense and culture. The nursery need not therefore be a kindergarten. Though every mother should be a kindergartnerin in the sense of which Froebel would employ the term, it does not follow that every nursery should be a regularly organised kindergarten. Indeed, the machinery of the kindergarten is no more than a device to ensure the carrying out of certain educational principles. And some of these it is the mother's business to get at and work out according to Froebel's method or her own. For instance, in the kindergarten, the child's senses are carefully and progressively trained. He looks, listens, learns by touch gets ideas of size, colour, form, number, is taught to copy faithfully, express exactly. And in this training of the senses, the child is made to pursue the method the infant shapes for himself in his early studies of ring or ball. Field of knowledge too circumscribed. But it is possible that the child's marvellous power of obtaining knowledge by means of his senses may be undervalued, that the field may be too circumscribed, and that during the first six or seven years in which he might have become intimately acquainted with the properties and history of every natural object within his reach, he has obtained exact ideas, it is true, can distinguish a rhomboid from a pentagon, a primary from a secondary colour, has learned to see so truly that he can copy what he sees in folded paper or woven straw. But this, at the expense of much of that real knowledge of the external world, which at no time of his life will he be so fitted to acquire. Therefore, while the exact, nicely graduated training of the kindergarten may be of value, the mother will endeavour to give it by the way and will by no means let it stand for that wider training of the senses to secure which for her children is a primary duty. Again, the child in the kindergarten is set to such tasks only as he is competent to perform and then whatever he has to do he is expected to do perfectly. I have seen a four-year-old child blush and look as self-condemned because he had folded a slip of paper irregularly as if found out in a falsehood. But mother or nurse is quite able to secure that the child's small offices are perfectly executed. And here is an important point. Without that slight strain of distressful anxiety, which may be observed in children labouring to please that smiling goddess, their kindergartnerin. Training of a just eye and faithful hand. The kindergarten occupations afford opportunities for training in this kind of faithfulness. But in the home, a thousand such opportunities occur. If only in such trifles as the straightening of a tablecloth or of a picture, the hanging of a towel, the packing of a parcel, 
every thoughtful mother invents a thousand ways of training in her child a just eye and a faithful hand. Nevertheless, as a means of methodical training, as well as of happy employment, the introduction of some of the games and occupations of the kindergarten into the nursery may be allowed, provided that the mother does not depend upon these, but makes all the child's occupations subserve the purposes of his education. Sweetness and light in the kindergarten. The child breathes an atmosphere of sweetness and light in the kindergarten. You see the sturdy urchin of five stiffen his back and decline to be a jumping frog and the kindergartner and comes in with unruffled gentleness, takes him by the hand and leads him out of the circle. He is not treated as an offender, only he does not choose to do as others do. Therefore, he is not wanted there. The next time, he is quite content to be a frog. Here we have the principle for the discipline of the nursery. Do not treat the child's small contumacy too seriously. Do not assume that he is being naughty. Just leave him out when he is not prepared to act in harmony with the rest. Avoid friction and above all, do not let him disturb the moral atmosphere. In all gentleness and serenity, remove him from the company of the others when he is being what the nurses call tiresome. Once more, the kindergarten professor to take account of the joyousness of the child's nature, to allow him full and free expression for the glee that is in him, without the rampaging which follows if he is left to himself to find an outlet for his exuberant life. This union of joy and gentleness is the very temper to be cultivated in the nursery. The boisterous behavior sometimes allowed in children is unnecessary, within doors at any rate, but even a momentary absence of sunshine on the faces of her children will be a graver cause of uneasiness to the mother. On the whole, we may say that some of the principles which should govern kindergarten training are precisely those which every thoughtful mother endeavours to bring up her family, while the practices of the kindergarten being only ways among others of carrying out these principles and being apt to become stereotyped and wooden are unnecessary, but may be adopted so far as they fit in conveniently with the mother's general scheme for the education of her family. Three, further consideration of the kindergarten. The childhood of Tolstoy. There is possibly no known field of research in which so little available work has been done as in that covered by the word children. The fair land lies under our very eyes, but whoso would map it out must write unexplored across vast tracts. Thoughtful persons begin to suspect that the mistakes we make through this ignorance are grievous and injurious. For example, are not all our schemes of education founded on the presumption that the child's mind, his thinking, feeling man, begins very small and grows great with the growth of his body? We cannot tell if this is indeed the case. The children keep themselves to themselves in a general way, their winning ways and frank confidences notwithstanding. But if one of us do, by chance, get a child revealed to him, he is startled to find that the child has by far the keener intelligence, the wiser thoughts, the larger soul of the two. When genius is able to lift the veil and show us a child, it does a service which, in our present state of thought, we are hardly able to appraise. And when genius or simplicity or both shall have given us enough such studies to generalize upon, we shall doubtless reconsider the whole subject and shall be dismayed at the slights we have been putting upon children in the name of education. Count Tolstoy gives us in childhood, boyhood, youth, unmistakable child portraiture, a miniature in which a mother may see her child and recognize 
what and how much is in him. Like our own dear mother, the little fellow writes in the verses he makes for his grandmother's birthday. And then when the verses came to be read, ah, the humiliation of the soul he goes through and how surely he expects father and grandmother to find him out for a hypocrite. Why did I write it? She's not here and it was not necessary to mention her. I love grandma, it's true. I reverence her, but still she is not the same. Why did I write it? Why have I lied? This is the sort of thing there is in children. We recognize it as we read and remember the dim childish days when we too had an organ of truth just so exquisitely delicate. And the recollection should quicken our reverence for the tender consciences of children. The story of a child. I should like, while speaking of this subject, to mention another book which contains the self-revelation of a child. A child that was once summoned to give evidence out of the dark abysm of time. This is the sort of study of a child that is really precious because it is to be had on no other terms than by harking back to our own childhood, vivifying it, reproducing it, by mere force of imaginative power. This is absolutely the only way to get into sympathy with a child, for children, with all their frank confidences and ready chatter, are quite inscrutable little persons who never tell anyone the sort of things that we read in this story. There is no need to tell each other, for the other children know. And as for telling the grown-ups, Children are fully persuaded that no grown-up, not even mother, could understand. Ponto might, perhaps, and confidences will be poured into the ear of a dog, which the loving mother lays herself out for in vain. Each in his hidden sphere of joy or woe, our hermit spirits dwell and range apart. Our eyes see all around in gloom or glow, hues of their own, fresh borrowed from the heart. And this is even more notably the case with children than with ourselves. It is a law of our nature that which it is, it is absolutely useless to contend and our only means of true intimacy with a child is the power of recovering our own childhood, a power which we are apt to let slip as of no vital importance. This Miss Margaret Deland helps us to do. We recognize our old selves with a difference in Ellen. Just so irrational, inconsequent, loving and heroic and generally tiresome to the grown up world where our own impulses in that long ago on which we look back with tenderness, but seldom with complacency. If we rise after reading the story of a child a little more humble, a little more diffident, ready to believe more than we see, why, it will do us no harm and should bless and help the children. From one word of the authors, we should like to differ. Mr. Land thinks it may be wholesome for the elders to understand children better, but for the children, why, she thinks that most of us grow up wonderfully well in spite of this and all other difficulties. In a sense, this is true. But in another sense, one of the saddest things in life is the issue of splendid child material into commonplace, uninteresting maturity of a kind the world seems to be neither the better nor the worse for. Tolstoy's childhood and that of Mr. Land's little heroine would appear to be a far cry from the kindergarten. But as a matter of fact, these two revelations of what children are bring our contention to a point. We are told that, but yesterday in the University of Edinburgh, the greatest figure in the faculty was Sir James Simpson, the discoverer of chloroform. The other day, his successor and nephew, Professor Simpson, was asked by the librarian of the university to go to the library and pick out the books on his subject that were no longer needed. And his reply to the librarian was this, 
Take every textbook that is more than 10 years old and put it down in the cellar. So far as education is a science, the truth of even 10, much more 100 years ago, is not the whole truth of today. Thoughts beyond their thought to those high seers were given. And in proportion, as the urgency of educational effort presses upon us, will be the ardour of our appreciation, the diligence of our employment, of those truths which the great pioneers, Froebel and the rest, have won for us by no less than prophetic insight. But alas, and alas for the cravings of lazy human nature, we may not have an educational pope. We must think out for ourselves as well as work out those things that belong to the perfect bringing up of our children. What we owe to Froebel. We reverence Froebel. Many of his great thoughts we share. We cannot say borrow because some, like the child's relations to the universe, are at least as old as Plato. Others belong to the universal practice and experience, and this shows their psychological rightness. Froebel gathered diffused thoughts and practice into a system, but he did a greater thing than this. He raised an altar to the enthusiasm of childhood upon which the flame has never since gone out. The true kindergartnerin is the artist among teachers. She is filled with the inspiration of her work and probably most sincere teachers have caught something from her fervor some sense of the beauty of childhood and of the enthralling delight of truly education work. Requirements of a person. And yet I enter a caveat. Our first care should be to preserve the individuality, give play to the personality of children. Now persons do not grow in a garden, much less in a greenhouse. It is a doubtful boon to a person to have conditions too carefully adapted to his needs. The exactly due sunshine and shade, pruning and training are good for a plant whose uses are subordinate, so to say, to the needs and pleasures of its owner. But a person has other uses in the world and mother or teacher who regards him as a plant and herself as a gardener will only be saved from grave mistakes by the force of human nature in herself and in her child. Nature as an educator. The notion of supplementing nature from the cradle is a dangerous one. A little guiding, a little restraining, much reverent watching, nature asks of us. But beyond that, it is the wisdom of parents to leave children as much as may be to nature and to a higher power than nature itself. Danger of undervaluing children's intelligence. Those of us who have watched an urchin of seven making Catherine wheels down the length of a street or a group of little girls dancing to a barrel organ or small boys and, and girls on a doorstep giving what Dickens calls dry nourishment to their babies, or a small girl sent by her mother to make four careful purchases out of sixpence and bring home the change, are not ready to believe that physical, mental and moral development waits, so to speak, upon kindergarten teaching. Indeed, I am inclined to question whether, in the interest of carrying out a system, the charming kindergartnerin is not in danger sometimes of greatly undervaluing the intelligence of her children. I know a person of three who happened to be found in a cellar alone in the drawing room. It was spring and the caller thought to make himself entertaining with talk about pretty bar lambs. But a pair of big blue eyes were fixed upon him and a solemn person made this solemn remark. Isn't it a dwellful, horrid thing to see a pig killed? We hope she had never seen or even heard of the killing of a pig, but she made as effective a protest against twaddle as would any woman of society. 
Boars and Copjes, Russians and Japs, Treasure Island, Robinson Crusoe and his man Friday, the fight of Thermolympha, Ulysses and the suitors. These are the sorts of things that children play at by the month together. Even the toddlers of three or four will hold their own manfully with their brothers and sisters. And if the little people were in the habit of telling how they feel, we should learn perhaps that they are a good deal bored by the nice little games in which they frisk like lambs, flap their fins and twiddle their fingers like butterflies. We all like to be humoured. But, says the reader, children do all these things so pleasantly and happily in the kindergarten. It is a curious thing about human nature that we all like to be managed by persons who take the pains to play on our amiabilities. Even a dog can be made foolishly sentimental. And if we who are older have our foibles of this kind, it is little wonder that children can be wooed to do anything by persons whose approaches to them are always charming. It is true that W.V., the child whom the world has been taught to love, sang her kindergarten songs with little hands waving in the air so blue. But that was for the delectation and delusion of the elders when bedtime came. W.V. had greater thoughts at other times. Teachers mediate too much. There are still probably kindergartens where a great deal of twaddle is talked in song and story, where the teacher conceives that to make poems for the children herself and to compose tunes for their singing and to draw pictures for their admiration is to fulfil her function to the uttermost. The children might echo Wordsworth's complaint of the world and say, the teacher is too much with us late and soon. Everything is directed, expected, suggested. No other personality out of book, picture or song, no, not even that of nature herself, can get at the children without the mediation of the teacher. No room is left for spontaneity or personal initiation on their part. Danger of personal magnetism. Most of us are misled by our virtues and the entire zeal and enthusiasm of the kindergarten room is perhaps her stone of stumbling. But the children are so happy and good. Precisely. The home nursery is by no means such a scene of peace, but I venture to think it a better growing place. I am delighted to see that an eminent Freudian protests against the element of personal magnetism in the teacher. But there is or has been a good deal of this element in the successful kindergartner in, and we all know how we lose vigour in individuality under this sort of influence. Even apart from this element of charm, I doubt if the self-adjusting property of life in the kindergarten is good for children. Kindergarten, a false analogy. The world suffered that morning when the happy name of kindergarten suggested itself to the greatest among the educational fathers. No doubt it was simple and fit in its first intention as a meaning of out of door garden life for the children. But a false analogy has hampered or killed more than one philosophic system. The child became a plant in a well-ordered garden. The analogy appeared to the orderly scientific German mind, which does not much approve of irregular spontaneous movement in any sort. Culture, due stimulus, sweetness and light became the chief features of a great educational code. From the potting shed to the frame and thence to the flower bed, the little plant gets in due, due proportion what is good for him. He grows in a seemly way, in ordered ranks, and in fit seasons puts forth his flower. Now, to figure a person by any analogy whatsoever is dangerous and misleading. There is nothing in nature commensurable with a person. 
Because the analogy of the garden plant is very attractive, it is the more misleading. Manifestations of the purpose in a plant are wonderful and delightful, but in a person such manifestations are simply normal. The outcome of any thought is necessarily moulded by that thought, and to have a cultivated garden as the ground plan for our educational thought either means nothing at all, which it would be wrongdoing of the masters to suppose, or it means undue interference with the spontaneous development of a human being. Mother games too strenuous for a child. To begin with, the mother games, a sweet conception, most lovingly worked out. But let us consider, the infant is exquisitely aware of every mood of his mother. The little face clouds with grief or beams with joy in response to the expression of hers. The two left to themselves have rare games. He jumps and pulls, crows and chuckles, crawls and kicks and gurgles with joy. And amid all the play, is taught what he may not do. Hands and feet, legs and arms, fingers and toes are continually going while he is awake. Mouth, eyes and ears are agog. All is play without intention. And mother plays with baby as glad as he. Nature sits quietly by and sees to it that all the play is really work and development of every sort is going on at a greater rate during the first two years of life than at any like period of afterlife. Enough development and not too much, for baby is an inordinate sleeper. Then comes in the educator and offers a little more. The new games are so pretty and taking that the baby may as well be doing these as his own meaningless and clumsy jumpings and pattings. But a real labour is being put upon the child in addition to the heaviest two years work that his life will know. His sympathy with his mother is so acute that he perceives something strenuous in the new play, notwithstanding all the smiles and pretty talk. He answers by endeavour, great in proportion as he is small. His nerve centres and brain power have been unduly taxed. Some of the joy of living has been taken from him. And though his baby response to direct education is very charming, he has less latent power left for the future calls of life. The society of his equals too stimulating for a child. Let us follow the little person to the kindergarten where he has the stimulus of classmates of his own age. It certainly is stimulating. For ourselves, no society is so much so as that of a number of persons of our own age and standing. This is the great joy of college life, a wholesome joy for all un young people for a limited time. But persons of 20 have, or should have, some command over their inhibitory centres. They should not permit the dissipation of nerve power caused by too much social stimulus. Yet even persons of 20 are not always equal to the task of self-management in ex exciting circumstances. What then is to be expected of persons of 2, 3, 4, 5? That the little person looks rather solid than otherwise is no guarantee against excitement within. The clash and sparkle of our equals now and then stirs us up to health. But for everyday life, the mixed society of elders, juniors and equals, which we get in a family, gives at the same time the most repose and the most room for individual development. We have all wondered at the good sense, reasonableness, fun and resourcefulness shown by a child in his own home as compared with the same child in school life. Danger of supplanting nature. Danger lurks in the kindergarten, just in proportion to the completeness and beauty of its organization. It is possible to supplement nature so skillfully that we run some risk of supplanting her, depriving her of the space and time to do her work in her own way. 
Go and see what Tommy is doing and tell him he mustn't is not sound doctrine. Tommy should be free to do what he likes with his limbs and his mind through all the hours of the day when he is not sitting up nicely at meals. He should run and jump, leap and tumble, lie on his face watching a worm or on his back watching bees in a lime tree. Nature will look after him and give him promptings of desire to know many things. And somebody must tell as he wants to know, or to do many things, and somebody should be handy just to put him in the way, and to be many things, naughty and good, and somebody should give direction. Importance of personal initiative. Here we come to the real crux of the kindergarten question. The busy mother says she has no leisure to be that somebody and the child will run wild and get into bad habits. But we must not make a fetish of habit. Education is a life as well as a discipline. Health, strength and agility, bright eyes and alert movements come of a free life out of doors, as it may be. And as for habits, there is no habit or power so useful to man or woman as that of personal initiative. The resourcefulness, the resourcefulness which will enable a family of children to invent their own games and occupations through the length of a summer's day is worth more in afterlife than a good deal of knowledge about cubes and hexagons. And this comes not of continual intervention on a mother's part, but of much masterly inactivity. Parents and teachers must sow opportunities. The educational error of our day is that we believe too much in mediators. Now, nature is her own mediator, undertakes herself to find work for eyes and ears, taste and touch. She will prick the brain with problems and the heart with feelings. And the part of mother or teacher in the early years, indeed all through life, is to sow opportunities and then to keep in the background, ready with a guiding or restraining hand, only when these are badly wanted. Mothers shirk their work and put it, as they would say, into better hands than their own, because they do not recognise that wise letting alone is the chief thing asked of them, seeing that every mother has in nature an all-sufficient handmaid who arranges for due work and due rest of mind, muscles and senses. In one way, the children of the poor have better chances than those of the rich. Poor children get education out of household ways, but there is a great deal of good teaching to be got out of a wisely ordered nursery and their own small persons and possessions should, as I have said, afford much kindergarten training to the little family at home. At six or seven definite lessons should be given and these need not be watered down or served with jam for the acute intelligences that will, will in this way be brought to bear on them. Only children. But what of only children, or the child too old to play with her baby brother? Surely the kindergarten is a great boon for these. Perhaps so, but a cottage child as a companion or a lively young nursemaid might be better. A child will have taught himself to paint, paste, cut paper, knit, weave, hammer and saw, make lovely things in clay, and sand, build castles with his bricks. Possibly too will have taught himself to read, write and do sums, besides acquiring no end of knowledge or notions about the world he lives in, by the time he is six or seven. What I contend for is that he shall do these things because he chooses, provided that the standard of perfection in his small works be kept before him. The child should be allowed some ordering of his life. The details of family living will give him the repose of an ordered life. 
but for the rest, he should have more free growing time than is possible in the most charming school. The fact that lessons look like play is no recommendation. They just want the freedom of play and the sense of his own ordering that belongs to play. Most of us have little enough opportunity for the ordering of our own lives, so it is well to make much of the years that can be given to children to gain this joyful experience. Helen Keller. I think that what I have said of natural development as opposed to any too carefully organized system is supported by a recent contribution of unique value to the science of education. I mean the autobiography of Helen Keller. When she was 19 years old, Helen had a severe illness in which she lost sight and hearing and consequently speech. She never recovered the lost senses. And here we should say was a soul almost inviolably sealed to which there was no approach but through a single sense of touch. Yet, this lady's book, written with her own unaided hands, she used a typewriter, with hardly any revision, should rank as a classic for the purity and pregnancy of the style, independently of the vital interest of the matter. How was the miracle accomplished? Of her childhood, Helen says herself that, save for a few impressions, the shadows of the prison house enveloped it. But there were always roses, and she had the sense of smell, and there was love. But she was not loving then. When she was seven, Miss Sullivan came to her. This lady had herself been blind for some years, and had been at the Perkins Institute, founded by that Dr. Howe who liberated the intelligence of Laura Bridgman. But Miss Sullivan is no mere output of any institution. She is a person of fine sanity and wholesomeness, trusting in her personal initiative and aware from the first that her work was to liberate the personality of her little pupil and by no means to superimpose her own. Thus I came up out of Egypt, says Miss Keller, on the arrival of her teacher and the voice which she heard from Sinai said, Knowledge is love and light and vision. And then follows that amazing and enthralling epic which tells how it was all done. How the one word water was the key which opened the doors of the child's mind, while the word love opened those of the closed heart. Thenceforth, many new words came every day with crowds of ideas. And it is not too much to say that this imprisoned and desolate child entered upon such a large inheritance of thought and knowledge, of gladness and vision, as few of us of the seeing and hearing world attain to. The instrument in this great liberation was nothing more than the familiar manual alphabet following, followed in the course of time by raised books and braille. Miss Sullivan on Systems of Education Like all great discoveries, this of a soul was in all its steps marked by simplicity. Miss Sullivan had little love for psychologists and all their ways, would have no experiments, would not have her pupil treated as a phenomenon, but as a person. No, she says, I don't want any more kindergarten materials. I am beginning to suspect all elaborate and special systems of education. They seem to me to be built up on the supposition that every child is a kind of idiot who must be taught to think, whereas if the child is left to himself, he will think more and better, if less showily. Let him go and come freely. Let him touch real things and combine his impressions for himself. Instead of sitting indoors at a little round table while a sweet-voiced teacher suggests how he build a stone wall with his wooden blocks or make a rainbow out of strips of coloured paper or plant straw trees in bead flower pots. 
Such teaching fills the mind with artificial associations that must be got rid of before the child can develop independent ideas out of actual experiences. It is a great thing to have a study of education, as it were, de novo, in which we see the triumph of mind, not only over apparently insuperable natural obstacles, but over the dead wall of systematized education, a more complete hindrance to many a poor child than her grievous defects proved to Helen Keller. The Kindergarten in the United States. This question of the kindergarten as the proper place for the education of young children is so important that I should like to recommend to parents and teachers the examination of the subject contained in the special reports published by the Board of Education. We must go to the United States to witness the apotheosis of educational theory. I say theory rather than practice because the American mind, like the French, seems to me severely logical, as well as generously impulsive. A theory arrives, is liberally entertained, and is set to work with due appliances on a magnificent scale to do that which in it lies for the education of a great people. That is to say, educational science in America appears to be deductive rather than inductive. Theories are translated into experiments with truly imposing zeal and generosity. An inductive theory of education is, on the other hand, arrived at by means of long, slow, various and laborious experiments which disclose here a little and there a little of universal truth. The Americans have chosen perhaps the easier way and in the end they too experiment upon their theory. The kindergarten system illustrates what I mean. Notwithstanding its German name, the kindergarten is not a common product of the fatherland. It is in America that the ideas of Froebel have received their greatest development, that the kindergarten has become a cult and the great teacher a prophet. But the impulse has worn itself out. Anyway, it is waxing weak. Mr. Thistleton Mark on the Kindergarten. According to Mr. Thistleton Mark, whose able paper on moral education in American schools offers matter for much profitable reflection, even a stationary Freudian is driven to have some better hold fast than the ipse dixit of the great reformer. The word kindergarten is no longer a proper noun signifying always and everywhere the one sole original and identical thing. It is a common noun and as such is assured of a more permanent place in American speech. That is to say, educational thought in America is tending toward the broad and natural conception expressed in the phrase, education is a life. But I wish that educationalists would give up the name kindergarten. I cannot help thinking that it is somewhat of a strain to the conscious mind to draw the cover of Freudian doctrine and practice over the broader and more living conceptions that are abroad today. Even revolutionized kindergarten practice must suffer from the memory and habit of weakness such as are pointed out by Dr. Stanley Hall in the following words. Dr. Stanley Hall on the kindergarten. The most decadent intellectual new departure of the American Freudbillists is the emphasis now laid upon the mother plays as the acme of kindergarten wisdom. These are represented by the very crude poems in different music and pictures illustrating certain incidents of child life believed to be of fundamental and typical significance. I have read these in German and in English, have strummed the music and have given a brief course of lectures from the sympathetic standpoint, trying to put all the new wine of meaning I could think of into them. But I am driven to the conclusion that if they are not positively unwholesome and harmful for the child, 
and productive of anti-scientific and unphilosophical intellectual habits in the teacher, they should nevertheless be superseded by the far better things now available. Another cardinal error of the kindergarten is the intensity of its devotion to gifts and occupations. In devising these, Froebel showed great sagacity, but the scheme as it left his own hands was a very inadequate expression of his educational ideas, even for his time. He thought it a perfect grammar of play and an alphabet of inst industries. And in this opinion, he was utterly mistaken. Play and industry were then relatively undeveloped. And while his devices were beneficent for the peasant children in the country, they lead in the interests of the modern city child a very pallid and unreal life. With these important utterances, I must conclude a superficial examination of the very important question. Is the kindergarten the best training ground for a child? Four, reading. Time of teaching to read an open question. Reading presents itself first among the lessons to be used as instruments of education, although it is open to discussion whether the child should acquire the art unconsciously from his infancy upward, or whether the effort should be deferred until he is, say, six or seven, and then made with vigor. In a valuable letter addressed to her son, John, we have the way of teaching to read adopted by that pattern mother, the mother of the Wesleys. Mrs. Wesley's plan. None of them was taught to read till five years old, except Kezi, in whose case I was overruled. And she was more years in learning than any of the rest had been in months. The way of teaching was this. The day before a child began to learn, the house was set in order. Everyone's work appointed to them and a charge given that no one should come into the room for nine to 12 or from two to five, which were our school hours. One day was allowed the child wherein to learn its letters. And each of them did in that time know all its letters, great and small, except Molly and Nancy, who were a day and a half before they knew them perfectly, for which I thought them then very dull. But the reason why I thought them so was because the rest learned them so readily. And your brother Samuel, who was the first child I ever taught, learned the alphabet in a few hours. He was five years old, the 10th of February. The next day he began to, to learn. And as soon as he knew the letters, began at the first chapter of Genesis. He was taught to spell the first verse then to read it over and over until he could read it offhand without hesitation. So on to the second verse, etc., till he took 10 verses for a lesson, which he quickly did. Easter fell low that year and by a wit sun tide, he could read a chapter very well for he continually read and had such a prodigious memory that I cannot remember to have told him the same word twice. What was yet stranger, any word he had learnt in his lesson, he knew wherever he saw it, either in his Bible or any other book, by which means he learned very soon to read an English author well. It is much to be wished that thoughtful mothers would more often keep account of the methods they employ with their children with some definite note on the success of this or that plan. Many persons consider that to learn to read a language so full of anomalies and difficulties as our own is a task which should not be imposed too soon on the childish mind. But as a matter of fact, few of us can recollect how or when we learn to read. For all we know, it came by nature like the art of running. And not only so, but often mothers of the educated class do not know how their children learn to read. Oh, he taught himself, is all the account his mother can give of little Dick's proficiency. 
whereby it is plain that this notion of the extreme difficulty of learning to read is begotten by the elders rather than by the children. There would be no little books entitled Reading Without Tears if tears were not sometimes shed over the reading lesson. But really, when that is the case, the fault rests with the teacher. The alphabet. As for his letters, the child usually teaches himself. He has his box of ivory letters and picks out P for pudding, B for blackbird, H for horse. Big and little, he knows them both. But the learning of the alphabet should be made a means of cultivating the child's observation. He should be made to see what he looks at. Make big B in the air and let him name it. Then let him make round O and crooked S and T for Tommy. And you name the letters as the little fingers form them with unsteady strokes in the air. To make the small letters thus from memory is a work of more art and requires more careful observation on the child's part. A tray of sand is useful at this stage. The child draws his finger boldly through the sand and then puts a back to his D. And behold, his first essay in making a straight line and a curve. But the devices for making the learning of the ABC interesting are endless. There is no occasion to hurry the child let him learn one form at a time and know it so well that he can pick out the D's, say, big and little, in a page of large print. Let him say D for duck, dog, doll, thus, D, uck, D, og, prolonging the sound of their initial consonant and at last sounding D alone, not D, but D. The mere sound of the consonant separated as far as possible from the following vowel. Let the child alone and he will learn the alphabet for himself. But few mothers can resist the pleasure of teaching it and there is no reason why they should for this kind of le learning is no more than play to the child and if the alphabet be taught to the little student his appreciation of both form and sound will be cultivated. When should he begin? Whenever his box of letters begins to interest him. The baby of two will often be able to name half a dozen letters and there is nothing against it so long as the finding and naming of letters is a game to him. But he not, must not be urged, required to show off, teased to find letters when his heart is set on other play. Word making. The first exercises in the making of words will be just as pleasant to the child. Exercises treated as a game which yet teach the powers of the letters will be better to begin with than actual sentences. Take up two of his letters and make the syllable at. Tell him it is the word we use when we say at home, at school. Then put b at bat cur, to, at, at, cat, fat, hat, mat, sat, rat, and so on. First, let the child say what the word becomes with each initial consonant. Then let him add the right consonant to at in order to make hat, pat, cat. Let the syllables all be actual words which he knows. Set the words in a row and let him read them off. Do this with the short vowel sounds in combination with each of the consonants and the child will learn to read off dozens of words of three letters and will master the short vowel sounds with initial and final consonants without effort. Before long, he will do the lesson for himself. How many words can you make with N? And another letter with ED? And another letter? etc. Do not hurry him. Word making with long vowels, etc. 
When this sort of exercise becomes so easy it is of no longer it is no longer interesting, let the long sounds of the vowels be learnt in the same way. Use the same syllables as before with a final e. Thus at becomes eight and we get late, pate, rate, etc. The child may be told that an a ah in rate is a long a, a ah in rat is a short a. He will make the new sets of words with much facility, helped by the experience he gained in the former lessons. Then the same sort of thing with final ng, ing, ang, ong, ung, as ring, fang, long, sung, initial th as then, that, final th as with pith, hath, lath, and so on, through endless combinations which will suggest themselves. This is not reading, but it is preparing the ground for reading. Words will be no longer unfamiliar perplexing objects when the child meets with them in a line of print. Require him to pronounce the words he makes with such finish and distinctness that he can himself hear and count the sounds in a given word. Early spelling. Accustom him from the first to shut his eyes and spell the word he has made. This is important. Reading is not spelling, nor is it necessary to spell in order to read well. But the good speller is the child whose eye is quick enough to take in the letters which compose it in the act of reading off a word. And this is the habit to be acquired from the first. Accustom, accustom him to see the letters in the word and he will do so without effort. If words were always made on a given pattern in English, if the same letters always represented the same sounds, learning to read would be an easy matter. For the child would soon acquire the few elements of which all words would, in that case, be composed. But many of our English words are each a law unto itself. There is nothing for it, but the child must learn to know them at sight. He must recognise which, precisely as he recognises B, because he has seen it before, been made to look at it with interest so that the pattern of the word is stamped on his retentive brain. This process should go on side by side with the other, the learning of the powers of the letters. For the, vo for the more variety you can throw into his reading lessons, the more will the child enjoy them. Lessons in word making help him to take intelligent interest in words. But his progress in the art of reading depends chiefly on his reading at sight lessons. Reading at sight. The teacher must be content to proceed very slowly, securing the ground under her feet as she goes. Say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, is the first lesson. Just those two lines. Read the passage for the child very slowly, sweetly, with just expression, so that it is pleasant to him to listen. Point to each word as you read, then point to twinkle, wonder, star, what, and expect the child to pronounce each word in the verse taken promiscuously. Then, when he shows that he knows each word by himself, and not before then, let him read the two lines with clear enunciation and expression. Insist from the first on clear, beautiful reading and do not let the child fall into a dreary monotone, no more pleasant to himself than to his listener. Of course, by this time he is able to say the two lines and let him say them clearly and beautifully. In his after lessons, he will learn the rest of the little poem. The reading of prose. At this stage, his reading lessons must advance so slowly that he may just as well learn his reading exercises, both prose and poetry, as recitation lessons. 
Little poems suitable to be learned in this way will suggest themselves at once. But perhaps prose is better on the whole as offering more than the words in everyday use of Saxon origin and of anomalous spelling. Short fables and such graceful simple prose as we have in Miss Gatty's Parables from Nature and still better in Miss Barbald's prose poems are very suitable. Even for their earliest reading lessons, it is unnecessary to put any twaddle into the hands of children. But we have not yet finished the reading lesson on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. The child should hunt through two or three passages of good clear type for little, star, you, are. Each of these words he has learned until the word he knows looks out upon him like the face of a friend in a crowd of strangers and he's able to pounce on it anywhere. Lest he grow weary with, weary with the search, the teacher should guide him unawares to the line or paragraph where the word he wants occurs. Already the child has accumulated a little capital. He knows eight or ten words so well that he will recognise them anywhere. And the lesson has occupied probably ten minutes. The next Reading at Sight lesson will begin with a hunt for the familiar words and then up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky should be gone through in the same way. As spelling is simply the art of seeing, seeing the letters in a word as we see the features on a face, say to the child, can you spell sky or any of the shorter words? He is put on his metal, and if he fails this time, be sure he will be able to spell the word when you ask him next. But do not let him learn to spell, or even say the letters aloud with the word before him. As for understanding what they read, the children will be full of bright, intelligent remarks and questions, and will take this part of the lesson into their own hands. Indeed, the teacher will have to be on her guard not to let them carry her away from the subject. Careful pronunciation. The little people will probably have to be pulled up on the score of pronunciation. They must render high, sky, like, world with delicate precision, diamond, they will no doubt wish to hurry over and say as diamond, just as they will reduce history to history. But there is another advantage of slow and steady progression. The saying of each word receives due attention and the child is trained in the habit of careful enunciation. Every day increases the number of words he is able to read at sight. And the more words he knows already, the longer his reading lesson becomes in order to afford the 10 or a dozen new words which he should master every day. A year's work. But what a snail's progress, you are inclined to say. Not so slow, after all. A child will thus learn without appreciable labour for two or three thousand words in the course of a year. In other words, he will learn to read. For the mastery of this number of words will carry him with comfort through most of the books that fall in his way. Ordinary method. Now compare the steady progress and constant interest and liveliness of such lessons with the deadly weariness of the ordinary reading lesson. The child blunders through a page or two in a dreary monotone without expression, with imperfect enunciation. He comes to a word he does not know and he spells it. That throws no light on the subject and he is told the word. He repeats it, but he has made no mental effort to secure the word. The next time he meets with it, the same process is gone through. The reading lesson for that day comes to an end. The pupil has been miserably bored and has not acquired one new word. 
Eventually, he learns to read somehow by mere dint of repetition. But consider what an abuse of his intelligence is a system of teaching which makes him undergo daily labour with little or no result and gives him a distaste for books before he has learned to use them. 5. The First Reading Lesson Two Mothers Confer You don't mean to say you would go plump into words of three or four syllables before a child knows his letters. It is possible to read words without knowing the alphabet, as you may know a face without singling out its features. But we learn not only the names but the sounds of the letters before we begin to read words. Our children learn their letters without any teaching. We always keep by us a shallow table drawer, the bottom covered half an inch deep with sand. Before they are two, the babies make round O and crooked S and T for Tommy, and so on, with dumpy, uncertain little fingers. The elder children teach the little ones by way of a game. The sand is capital. We have various devices, but none so good as that. Children love to be doing. The funny, shaky lines the little fingers make in the sand will be 10 times as interesting as the shapes the eye sees. But the reading, I can't get over three syllables for the first lesson. Why, it's like teaching a 12 month old child to waltz. You say that because we forget that a group of letters is no more than the sign of a word, while a word is only the vocal sign of a thing or act. This is how the child learns. First, he gets the notion of table. He sees several tables, he finds they have legs, by which you can scramble up, very often covers which you may pull off, and on them many things lie, good and pleasant for a baby to enjoy. Sometimes too, you can pull these things off the table, and they go down with a bang, which is nice. The grown-up people call this pleasant thing, full of many interests, table, and by and by a baby says table too, and the word table comes to mean in a vague way all this to him. A round table, on the table and so forth form part of the idea of table to him. In the same way baby chimes in when his mother sings. She says baby sing and by and by notions of sing, kiss, love dawn on his brain. Yes the darlings and it's surprising how many words a child knows even before he can speak them. Pussy, dolly, carriage soon convey interesting ideas to him. That's just so. Interest the child in the thing and he soon learns the sound sign for it. That is its name. Now I maintain that when he is a little older he should learn the form sign, that is the printed word, on the same principle. It is far easier for a child to read plum pudding than to read two, two, because plum pudding conveys a far more interesting idea. That may be when he gets into words of three or four syllables, but what would you do while he is in words of one syllable, indeed of two or three letters? I should never put him into words of one syllable at all. The bigger the word, the more striking the look of it and therefore the easier it is to read, provided always that the idea it conveys is interesting to a child. It is sad to see an intelligent child toiling over a reading lesson infinitely below his capacity, ath, eth, of, uth, or at the very best, the cat sat on the mat. How should we like to begin to read German? For example, by toiling over all conceivable combinations of letters, arranged on no principle but the similarity of sound, or worse still, that our readings should be graduated according to the number of letters each word contains. We should be lost in a hopeless fog before a page of words of three letters, all drearily like one another with no distinctive feature for the eye to seize upon. But the child? Oh well, children are different, no doubt, 
It is good for one child to grind at this mill, but this is only one of many ways in which children are needlessly and cruelly oppressed. You are taking a high moral ground. All the same, I don't think I am convinced. It is far easier for a child to spell cat, cat, than spell plum pudding. But spelling and reading are two things. You must learn to spell in order to write words, not to read them. A child is droning over a reading lesson, spells cough, you say cough, and she repeats. By dint of repetition, she learns at last to associate the look of the word with the sound and says cough without spelling it. And you think she has arrived at cough through C-O-U-G-H. Not a bit of it. Cut off spells cough. Yes, but cough has a silent U and a G-H with the sound of F. There, I grant, it is a great difficulty. If only there were no silent letters, and if all letters had always the same sound, we should indeed have reading made easy. The phonetic people have something to say for themselves. You would agree with the writer of an article in a number of a leading review. Plow ought to be written and printed P-L-O-W through T-H-R-U enough E-N-U-F ought A-U-T or O-R-T and so on. All this goes on the mistaken idea that in reading we look at the letters which compose a word, think of their sounds, combine these and form the word. We do nothing of the kind. We accept a word written or printed simply as the symbol of a word we are accustomed to say. If the word is new to us, we may try to make something of the letters, but we know so well that this is a shot in the dark, that we are careful not to say the new word until we have heard someone else say it. Yes, but children are different. Children are the same, only more so. We could, if we liked, break up a word into its sounds or put certain, certain sounds together to make a word. But these are efforts of mind beyond the range of children. First, at last, they learn to know a word by the look of it. And the more striking it looks, the easier it is to recognize. Provided always that the printed word is the one which they already know very well by sound and by sense. It is not clear yet. Suppose you tell me, step by step, how you would give your first reading lesson. An illustration helps one so much. Very well. Bobby had his first lesson yesterday on his sixth birthday. The lesson was part of the celebration. By the way, I think it's rather a good plan to begin a new study with a child on his birthday or some great day. He begins by thinking the new study is a privilege. That is a hint, but go on. Did Bobby know his letters? Yes, he had picked them up, as you say, but I had been careful not to allow any small readings. You know how Susanna Wesley used to retire to her room with the child who was to have his first reading lesson and not appear again for some hours when the boy came out able to read a good part of the first chapter of Genesis? Well, Bobby's first reading lesson was a solemn occasion too, for which we had been preparing for a week or two. First, I bought a dozen penny copies of the History of Cock Robin. Good, bold type, bad pictures that we cut out. Then we had a nursery pasting day, pasting the sheets on common drawing paper, six one side down and six the other, so that now we had six complete copies and not 12. Then we cut up the first page only of all six copies line by line and word by word. We gathered up the words and put them in a box and our preparations were complete. Now, for the lesson, Bobby and I are shut in by ourselves in the morning room. I always use a blackboard in teaching the children. I write up in good clear print hand, cock 
Robin. Bobby watches with more interest because he knows his letters. I say pointing to the word cock robin, which he repeats. Then the words in the box are scattered on the table and he finds half a dozen cock robins with great ease. We do the same thing with sparrow, arrow, said, killed, who, and so on, till all the words in the verse have been learned. The words on the blackboard grow into a column, which Bobby reads backwards and forwards and every way except as the words run in the verse. Then Bobby arranges the loose words into columns like that on the board, then into columns of his own devising which he reads off. Lastly, culminating joy, the whole lesson has been a delight, he finds among the loose words at my indication, who killed cock robin? I said the sparrow with my bow and arrow. I killed cock robin. Arranging the words in verse form. Then I had still one unmutilated copy out of which Bobby had the pleasure of reading the verse and he read it forwards and backwards. So long as he lives, he will know those 12 words. No doubt it was a pleasant lesson, but think of all that pasting and cutting. Yes, that is troublesome. I wish some publisher would provide us with what we want, nursery rhymes in good bold type with boxes of loose words to match, a separate box or division for each page so that the child may not be confused by having too many words to hunt among. The point is, th is that he should see and look at the new words many times so that its shape becomes impressed on his brain. I see, but he is only able to read Cock Robin. He has no general power of reading. On the contrary, he will read those 12 words wherever he meets with them. Suppose he learns 10 words a day. In half a year, he will have at least 600 words he will know how to read a little. Excellent, supposing your child remember all they learn. At the end of the week, mine would remember Cock Robin perhaps, but the rest would be gone. Oh, but we keep what we get. When we have mastered the words of the second verse, Bob runs through the first of the book, naming words here and there, and I point to them. It takes less than a minute and the ground is secured. The first lesson must have been long. I'm sorry to say it lasted half an hour. The child's interest tempted me to do more than I should. It all sounds very attractive, a sort of game, but I cannot be satisfied that a child should learn to read without knowing the powers of letters. You constantly see a child spell a word over to himself and then pronounce it. The more so if he has been carefully taught the sounds of the letters, not merely their names. Naturally, for though many of our English words are each a law unto itself, others offer a key to a whole group. As arrow gives us sp arrow, m arrow, h arrow. But we have alternate days, one for reading, the other for word building, and that is one way to secure variety. And so the joyous interest, which is the real secret of success. Six, reading by sight and by sound. Learning to read is hard work. Probably that vague hole, which we call education, offers no more difficult or repellent task than that to which every little child is, or ought to be, set down, the task of learning to read. We realise the labour of it when, when, when some grown man makes a heroic effort to remedy shameful ignorance, but we forget how contrary to nature it is for a little child to occupy himself with dreary hieroglyphics. All so dreadfully alike, when the world is teeming with interesting objects which he is agog to know. But we cannot excuse our volatile Tommy, nor is it good for him that we should. It is quite necessary he should know how to read. And not only so, the discipline of the task is altogether wholesome for the little man. 
At the same time, let us recognise that learning to read is to many children hard work and let us do what we can to make the task easy and inviting. Knowledge of arbitrary symbols. In the first place, let us bear in mind that reading is not a science nor an art. Even if it were, the child must still be the first consideration with the educator, but it is not. Learning to read is no more than picking up how we can a knowledge of certain arbitrary symbols of objects and ideas. There are absolutely no right or necessary steps to reading, each of which leads to the next. There is no true beginning, middle or end. For the arbitrary symbols we must know in order to read are not letters, but words. By way of illustration, consider the delicate differences of sound represented by the letter O in the last sentence. To analyse and classify the sound of O in four symbols, no, order, to, not, and words, is a curious, not especially useful study for a philologist, but a laborious and inappropriate one for a child. It is time we face the fact that the letters which compose an English word are full of philological interest and that their study will be a valuable part of education by and by but meantime, sound and letter sign are so loosely wedded in Eng English that to base the teaching of reading on the sounds of letters only is to lay up for the children much analytic labor, much mental confusion due to the irregularities of the language. And some little moral strain in making the sound of a letter in a given word fall under any of the sounds he has been taught. Definitely, what is it we propose in teaching a child to read? A. That he shall know at sight, say some thousand words. B. That he shall be able to build up new words with the elements of these. Let him learn 10 new words a day and in 20 weeks he will be to some extent able to read without any question as to the number of letters in a word. For, for the second and less important part of our task, the child must know the sounds of the letters and acquire power to throw given sounds into new combinations. What we want is a bridge between the child's natural interests and those arbitrary symbols which he must become acquainted and which, as we have seen, are words and not letters. These symbols should be interesting. The child cares for things, not words. His analytic power is very small. His observing faculty is exceedingly quick and keen. Nothing is too small for him. He will spy out the eye of a fly. Nothing is too intricate. He delights in puzzles. But the thing he learns to know by looking at it is a thing which interests him. Here we have the key to reading. No meaningless combinations of letters, no cla, cli, cli, clo, cla, no ath, eth, ith, oth, ath should be presented to him. The child should be taught from the first to regard the printed word as he already regards the spoken word as the symbol of fact or idea full of interest. How easy to read robin, redbreast, buttercups and daisies. The number of letters in the words is no matter. The words themselves convey such interesting ideas that the general form and look of them fixes itself on the child's brain by the same law of association of ideas which makes it easy to couple the objects with their spoken names. Having got a word fixed on the sure peg of the idea it conveys, the child would use his knowledge of sounds of the letters to make up other words containing the same elements with great interest. When he knows butter, he is quite ready to make mutter by changing the B for an M. Tommy's first lesson. But example is better than precept and more convincing than the soundest reasoning. 
This is the sort of reading lesson we have in view. Tommy knows his letters by name and sound, but he knows no more. Today he is to be launched into the very middle of reading without any steps at all, because reading is neither an art nor a science and has probably no beginning. Tommy is to learn to read today. I like little pussy, her coat is so warm. And he is to know all the, those nine words so well that he will be able to read them wherever they may occur henceforth and forevermore. Oh yes, says a reader, as in the Cock Robin lesson, grant that the principle is sound, and there is much to be said on both sides of that question. But grant it, who in the world could get through all the pasting and cutting and general messing preparatory to the great lesson? No, the method of the books may be the only second best, but ready-made books must do for me. I have no time to make my own apparatus. I must own that the cutting and pasting was very clumsy, but the lesson served its purpose because it induced a good friend to education to have a delightful little pussy box prepared for us. Loose words, nice big type, two lines in a bag. Whoso learns little pussy, as it should be learned, will know at least 100 words. Not a bad stock in trade for a beginner. All of them good, useful words that we want every day. There is one objection. Such contractions as I'll are ugly at the best. And I hope that in the word lessons based upon little pussy, pieces will be sh chosen in which this fault is avoided. Steps. And now we begin Materiel, Tommy's box of loose letters the new little pussy box, pencil and paper, or much better, blackboard and chalk. We write up in good big print hand, pussy. Tommy watches with interest. He knows the letters and probably says them as we write. Besides, he's prepared for the great event of his life. He knows he's going to begin to learn to read today but we do not ask anything yet of his previous knowledge. We simply tell him that the word is pussy. Interest at once. He knows the thing, pussy, and the written symbol is pleasant in his eyes because it is associated with an existing idea in the mind. He is told to look at the word pussy until he is sure he would know it again. Then he makes pussy from memory with his own loose letters. Then the little bag containing our two lines in loose words is turned out and he finds the word pussy and lastly the little sheet with the poem printed on it is shown to him and he finds pussy but is not allowed yet to find out the run of the rhyme. Coat, little, like, is, her, warm, I, so are taught in the same way, in less time than it takes to describe the lesson. When each new word is learned, Tommy makes a column of the old ones and reads up and down the crisscross, the column on the blackboard. Reading sentences. He knows words now, but he cannot yet read sentences. Now for the delight of reading. He finds at our dictation among his loose words, pussy is warm, places them in reading order, one after the other, and then reads off the sentence. Joy, as of one who has found a new planet. And Tommy has indeed found a new power. Then her little coat is warm. Pussy is so little. I like pussy. Pussy is little like her coat. And so on, through a dozen more little arrangements. If the rhyme can be kept a secret till the whole is worked out, so much the better. To make the verses up with his own loose words will give Tommy such a delicious sense 
that knowledge is power as few occasions in after life will afford. Anyway, reading is to him a delight henceforth, and it will require very bad management indeed to make him hate it. Tommy's second lesson. Tommy promises himself another reading lesson next day, but he has instead a spelling lesson, conducted somewhat in this way. He makes the word coat with his letters, from memory if he can, if not with the pattern word. Say coat slowly, give the sound of the k, take away k and what have we left? A little help will get oat from him. How would you make boat? Say the word very slowly. Bring out the sound of b, boat. He knows the sounds of the letters and says b, oat readily. Full, oat. Two added sounds, which you lead him to find out. G, oat. He will give you the g and find goat, a charming new word to know. Moat. He easily decides on the sound of m. A little talk about moat. The other words are too familiar to need explanation. Tommy will no doubt offer n oat, but we must make a clean breast of it and say no, note is spelt with other letters. But what other letters we do not tell him now. Thus he comes to learn incidentally and very gradually that different groups of letters may stand for the same sounds. But we do not ask him to generalize. We only let him have the fact that n oat does not spell the symbol we express by n-o-t-e. Stoat, he will be able to give the sounds of the initial letters and Stoat again calls for a little talk. Another interesting word. He has made a group of words with his letters and there they are on the blackboard in a column. Thus, k oat, m oat, g oat, full oat, st oat, b oat. He reads the column up and down and crisscross. Every word has a meaning and carries an idea. Then the loose words he knows are turned out and we dictate new sentences which he arranges. I like her goat. Her little stoat is warm. And so on, making the new words with loose letters. Unknown words. Now for a new experience. We dictate pussy is in the boat. Consternation. Tommy does not know in nor thee. Put counters for the words you don't know. They may soon come out in our lessons. And Tommy has a desire and a need that is an appetite for learning. Like combinations have different sounds. We deal with the remaining words in the same way. Little gives brittle, tittle, skittle. Pussy is I and her give no new words. Like gives Mike and Pike. So gives no, do, the musical do, and lo. From warm we get arm, harm, charm, balm, alarm. We pronounce warm as arm. Tommy perceives that such a pronunciation is wrong and vulgar and sees that all these words are sounded like arm, but not one of them like warm. That is, he sees that the same group of letters need not always have the same sound. But we do not ask him to make a note of this new piece of knowledge. We will let it grow into him gradually after many experiences. By this time, he has 18 new words on the blackboard of which to make sentences with the nine loose words of pussy. Her skittle is little. Her charm is brittle. Her arm is warm and so on. But we take care that the sentences make sense. Her goat is brittle, is silly and not, and not to be thought of at all. 
Tommy's new words are written in his notebook in print hand so that he can take stock of his possessions in the way of words. Moral training in reading lessons. The next day, we do the last two lines of the stanza as at first. These lines afford hardly any material for a spelling lesson. So in our next lesson, we will go on with the second verse. But our stock of words is growing. We are able, as we go on, to make an almost unlimited number of little sentences. If we have to use counters now and then, why, that only whets our appetite for knowledge. By the time Tommy has worked little pussy through, he has quite a large stock of word, words, has considerable power to attack new words with familiar combinations. What is more, he's achieved. He has courage to attack all learning and has a sense that delightful results are quite within reach. Moreover, he learns to read in a way that affords him some moral training. There is no stumbling no hesitation from the first, but bright attention and per perfect achievement. His reading lesson is a delight of which he is deprived when he comes to his lesson in a lazy, drawling mood. Perfect enunciation and precision are insisted on. And when he comes to arrange the whole of the little rhyme in his loose words and read it off, most delightful of all the lessons, his reading must be a perfect and finished recitation. I believe that this is a pr practical, common sense way to teach reading in English. It may be profitable for the little German child to work through all possible dreary combinations of letters before he is permitted to have any joy in reading because wherever these combinations occur, they will have the sounds the child has learned laboriously. The fact that English is anomalous as regards the connection between sign and sound happily exonerates us from enforcing this dreary grind. 7. Recitation The Children's Art on this subject, I cannot do better than refer the reader to Mr. Arthur Burrell's recitation. This book purports to be a handbook for teachers in elementary schools. I wish that it may be very largely used by such teachers and may also become a family handbook, though many of the lessons will not be called for in educated homes. There is hardly any subject so educative and so elevating as that which Mr. Burrell has happily described as the children's art. All children have it in them to recite. It is an imprisoned gift waiting to be delivered, like Ariel from the Pine. In this most thoughtful and methodical volume, we're possessed of the fit incantations. Use them duly and out of the woodenness of even the most commonplace child steps forth the child artist, a delicate sprite who shall make you laugh and make you weep. Did not the great Sir Walter sway to and fro, sobbing his fill to his little pets speak of, for I am sick and capable of fears, oppressed with wrong and therefore full of fears, a widow, husbandless, subject to fears, a woman naturally born into fears. Marjorie Fleming was, to be sure, a child genius. But in this book, we learn by what carefully graduated steps a child who is not a genius, is not even born of cultivated parents, may be taught the fine art of beautiful and perfect speaking but that it is only the first step in the acquisition of the children's art. The child should speak beautiful thoughts so beautifully with such delicate rendering of each nuance of meaning that he becomes to the listener the interpreter of the author's thought. Now, consider what appreciation, sympathy, power of expression this implies, and you will grant that the children's art is, as Steele says, of the society of his wife, a liberal education in itself. It is objected, children are such parrots. 
they say a thing as they hear it is said. As for troubling themselves to appreciate and interpret, not a bit of it. Most true of the my name is novel style of recitation. But throughout this volume, the child is led to find the just expression of the thought for himself. Never is the poor teacher allowed to set a pattern. Say this as I say it. The ideas are kept well within the child's range and the expression is his own. He is caught with guile. His very naughtiness is pressed into service. He finds a dozen ways of saying, I shan't, is led cunningly up to the point of expressing himself and he does it to his own surprise and delight. The pieces given here for recitation are a treasure trove of new joys. Winkin, Blinkin and Nod, Miss Lily White's party and the two kittens would compel any child to recite. Try a single piece over with the author's markings and suggestions and you will find there is as much difference between the result and ordinary reading aloud as there is in a musical composition played with and without the composer's expression marks. I hope that my readers will train their children in the art of recitation. In the coming days, more even than in our own, will it behove every educated man and woman to be able to speak effectively in public. And in learning to recite, you learn to speak. Memorising. Recitation and committing to memory are not necessarily the same thing. And it is well to store a child's memory as with a good deal of poetry learnt without labour. Some years ago, I chanced to visit a house, the mistress of which had educational notions of her own, upon which she was bringing up a niece. She presented me with a large full scap sheet written all over with the titles of poems, some of them long and difficult. Tintern Abbey, for example. She told me that her niece could repeat to me any of those poems that I liked to ask for and that she had never learnt a single verse by heart in her life. The girl did repeat several of the poems on the list quite beautifully and without hesitation. And then the lady unfolded her secret. She thought she had made a discovery and I thought so too. She read a poem through to E. Then the next day, while the little girl was making a doll's frock, perhaps she read it again. Once again the next day, while E's hair was being brushed. Then she got in about six or more readings, according to the length of the poem, at odd or and unexpected times. And in the end, E could say the poem which she had not learned. I have tried the plan often since and found it effectual. The child must not try to recollect or to say the verse over to himself, but as far as may be, present an open mind to receive an impression of interest. Half a dozen repetitions should give children possession of such poems as Dolly and Dick. Do you ask what the birds say? Little lamb, who made thee? And the like. The gains of such a method of learning are that the edge of the child's enjoyment is not taken off by the we weariful verse by verse repetitions and also that the habit of making mental images is unconsciously formed. I remember once discussing this subject with the late Miss Anna Swansink in some connection with Browning, which I do not recall. But in the course of talk, an extremely curious incident transpired. A lady, a niece of Miss Swansink's, said that after a long illness during which she had not been allowed to do anything, she read Lycidas through by way of a first treat to herself as a convalescent. She was surprised to find herself the next day repeating to herself long passages. Then she tried the whole poem and found she could say it off. The result of this single reading. For she had not learned the poem before her illness, nor read it with particular attention. 
she was much elated by the treasure trove she had chanced upon. And to test her powers, she read the whole of Paradise Lost, book by book, and with the same result. She could repeat it book by book after a single reading. She enriched herself by acquiring other treasures during her convalescence. But as health returned and her mind became preoccupied with many interests, she found she no longer had this astonishing power. It is possible that the disengaged mind, mind of a child is as free to take and as strong to hold beautiful images clothed in beautiful words as was that of this lady during her convalescence. But let me once again say, every effort of the kind, however unconscious, means wear and tear of brain substance. Let the child lie fallow till he is six, and then, in this matter of memorising, as in others, attempt only a little, and let the poems the child learns be simple and within the range of his own thought and imagination. At the same time, when there is so much noble poetry within a child's compass, the pity of it that he should be allowed to learn twaddle. Eight, reading for older children. In teaching to read, as in other matters, ce le premier par qui coûte. The child who has been taught to read with care and deliberation until he has mastered the words of a limited vocabulary usually does the rest for himself. The attention of his teachers should be fixed on two points, that he acquires the habit of reading and that he does not fall into slipshod habits of reading. The habit of reading. The most common and the monstrous defect in the education of the day is that children fail to acquire the habit of reading. Knowledge is conveyed to them by lessons and talk, but the studious habit of using books as a means of interest and delight is not acquired. This habit should be begun early, so soon as the child can read at all, he should read for himself and to himself history, legends, fairy tales, and other suitable matter. He should be trained from the first to think that one reading of any lesson is enough to enable him to narrate what he has read and will thus get the habit of slow, careful reading, intelligent even when it is silent, because he reads with an eye to the full meaning of every clause. Reading aloud. He should have practice too in reading aloud for the most part in the books he is using for his term's work. These should include a good deal of poetry to accustom him to the delicate rendering of shades of meaning and especially to make him aware that words are beautiful in themselves, that they are a source of pleasure and are worthy of our honour. And that a beautiful word deserves to be beautifully said with a certain roundness of tone and precision of utterance. Quite young children are open to this sort of teaching, conveyed not in a lesson, but by a word now and then. Limitation. In this connection, the teacher should not trust to setting, as it were, a copy in reading for the child's imagination. They do imitate readily enough, catching tricks of emphasis and action in an amusing way. But these are mere tricks, an aping of intelligence. The child must express what he feels to be the author's meaning. And this sort of intelligent reading comes only of the habit of reading with understanding. Reading to children. It is a delight to older people to read aloud to children, but this should be only an occasional treat and indulgence, allowed before bedtime, for example. We must remember the natural inertness of a child's mind, give him the habit of being read to, and he will steadily shirk the labour of reading for himself. Indeed, we all like to be spoon-fed with our intellectual meat, or we should read and think more for ourselves and be less eager to run after lectures. 
Questions on the subject matter. When a child is reading, he should not be teased with questions as to the meaning of what he has read, the signification of this word or that. What is annoying to older people is equally annoying to children. Besides, it is not of the least consequence that they should be able to give the meaning of every word they read. A knowledge of meanings, that is an ample and correct vocabulary, is only arrived at in one way, by the habit of reading. A child unconsciously gets the meaning of a new word from the context. If not the first time he meets with it, then the second or the third. But he is on the lookout. He will find out for himself the sense of any expression he does not understand. Direct questions on the subject matter of what a child has read are always a mistake. Let him narrate what he has read or some part of it. He enjoys this sort of consecutive reproduction, but abominates every question in the nature of a riddle. If there must be riddles, let it be his to ask and the teachers to direct him to the answer. Questions that lead to a side issue or a personal view are allowable because these interest children. What would you have done in his place? Lesson books. A child has not begun his education until he has acquired the habit of reading to himself, with interest and pleasure, books fully on a level with his intelligence. I am speaking now of his lesson books, which are all too apt to be written in a style of insufferable twaddle, probably because they are written by a person who have never chanced to meet a child. All who know children know that they do not talk twaddle and do not like it and prefer that which appeals to their understanding. Their lesson books should offer matter for their reading, whether aloud or to themselves. Therefore, they should be written with literary power. As for the matter of these books, let us remember that children can take in ideas and principles, whether the latter be moral or mechanical, as quickly and clearly as we do ourselves, perhaps more so. But detailed processes, lists and summaries blunt the edge of a child's delicate mind. Therefore, the selection of their first lesson books is a matter of grave importance because it rests with these to give children the idea that knowledge is supremely attractive and that reading is delightful. Once the habit of reading his lesson books with delight is set in up in a child, his lesson is not completed but ensured. He will go on for himself in spite of the obstructions which school too commonly throws his way. Slipshod habits in attention. I have already spoken of the importance of a single reading. If a child is not able to narrate what he has read once, let him not get the notion that he may or that he must read it again. A look of slight regret because there is a gap in his knowledge will convict him. The power of reading with perfect attention will not be gained by the child who is allowed to moon over his lessons. For this reason, reading lessons must be short. 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour of fixed attention is enough for a child of the ages we have in view. And a lesson of this length will enable a child to cover two or three pages of his book. The same rule as to the length of a lesson applies to the ch children whose lessons are read to them because they are not yet able to read for themselves. Careless enunciation. It is important that when reading aloud, children should make due use of the vocal organs. And for this reason, a reading lesson should be introduced by two or three simple breathing exercises, as for example, a long inspiration with closed lips and a slow expiration with open mouth. If a child read through his nose, it is well to consult a doctor an operation for the adenoids may be necessary, which is rarely distressing and should be performed while children are young. Provincial pronunciation and slipshod enunciation must be guarded against. The practice in pure vowel sounds 
and the respect for words which will not allow of their being hastily slurred over should cure these defects. By the way, quite little children commonly enunciate beautifully because a big word is a new acquirement which they delight in and make the most of. Our efforts should be directed to make older children hold words in like esteem. The habit of minding your stops comes of intelligent reading. A child's understanding of the passage will lead him to correct pointing. Nine, the art of narrating. Children narrate by nature. Narrating is an art like poetry making or painting because it is there in every child's mind waiting to be discovered and is not the result of any process of disciplinary education. A creative fiat calls it forth. Let him narrate and the child narrates fluently, copiously, in ordered sequence, with fit and graphic details, with a just choice of words, without verbiosity or tautology, so soon as he can speak with ease. This amazing gift with which normal children are born is allowed to lie fallow in their education. Bobby will come home with a heroic narrative of a fight he has seen between Duke and a dog in the street. It is wonderful. He has seen everything and he tells everything with splendid vigor in the true epic vein. But so ingrained is our contempt for children that we see nothing in this but Bobby's foolish, childish way. Whereas here, if we have eyes to see and grace to build, is the ground plan of his education. Until he is six, let Bobby narrate only when and what he is a mind to. He must not be called upon to tell anything. Is this the secret of strange long talks we watch with amusement between creatures of two and four and five? Is it possible that they narrate while they are still inarticulate and that the other inarticulate person takes it all in? They try us, poor dear elders, and we reply, yes, really, do you think so? To the babble of whose meaning we have no comp comprehension. Be this as it may, of what goes on in the dim region of under two we have no assurance. But wait till the little fellow has words and he will tell without end to whomsoever will listen to the tale. But for choice his own compeers. This power should be used in their education. Let us take the goods the gods provide. When the child is six, not earlier, let him narrate the fairy tale which has been read to him, episode by episode, upon one hearing of each. The Bible tale read to him in the words of the Bible, the well-written animal story, or all about other lands of some such volume as The World at Home. The seven-year-old boy will have begun to read for himself, but must get most of his intellectual nutriment by ear, certainly, but read to him out of books. Geography, sketches from ancient history, Robinson Crusoe, The Pilgrim's Progress, Tanglewood Tales, Heroes of Asgard, and much of the same calibre will occupy him until he is eight. The points to be borne in mind are that he should have no book which is not a child's classic, and that, given the right book, it must not be diluted with talk or broken up with questions, but given to the boy in fit portions as wholesome meat for his mind, in the full trust that a child's mind is able to deal with its proper food. The child of eight or nine is able to tackle the more serious material of knowledge, but our business for the moment is with what children under nine can narrate. Method of lesson. In every case, the reading should be consecutive from a well-chosen book. Before the reading of the day begins, the teacher should talk a little and get the children to talk about the last lesson with a few words about what is to be read 
in order that the child may be animated by expectation. But she should beware of explanation and especially of forestalling the narrative. Then she may read two or three pages enough to include an episode. After that, let her call upon the children to narrate in turns if there be several of them. They not only narrate with spirit and accuracy, but succeed in catching the style of their author. It is not wise to tease them with corrections. They may begin with an endless chain of ands, but soon leave this off, and their narrations become good enough in style and composition to be put in a print book. This sort of narration lesson should not occupy more than a quarter of an hour. The book should be always deeply interesting, and when the narration is over, there should be a little talk in which some moral points are brought out, pictures shown to illustrate the lesson, or diagrams drawn on the blackboard. As soon as children are able to read with ease and fluency, they read their own lesson, either aloud or silently, with a view to narration. But where it is necessary to make omissions, as in the Old Testament narratives and Plutarch's lives, for example, it is better that the teacher should always read the lesson which is to be narrated. 10. Writing. Perfect accomplishment. I can only offer a few hints on the teaching of writing, though much might be said. First, let the child accomplish something perfectly in every lesson, a stroke, a pot hook, a letter. Let the writing lesson be short. It should not last more than five or 10 minutes. Ease in writing comes by practice, but that must be secured later. In the meantime, the thing to be avoided is the habit of careless work, humpy M's, angular O's. Printing. But the child should have practice in printing before he begins to write. First, let him print the simplest of the capital letters with, a single, with single curves and straight lines. When he can make the capitals and large letters with some firmness and decision, he might go on to small letters, printed, as in the type we call italics, only upright, as simple as possible and large. Steps in teaching. Let the stroke be learned first, then the pot hook then the letters of which the pot hook is an element, N, M, V, W, R, H, P, Y, then O, and letters of which the curve is an element, A, C, G, E, X, S, Q, then looped and irregular letters, B, L, F, T, etc. One letter should be perfectly formed in a day, and the next day the same elemental forms repeated in another letter until they become familiar. By and by copies, three or four of the letters they have learned grouped into a word, man, aunt, the lesson to be a production of the written word once without a single fault in any letter. At this stage, the chalk and blackboard are better than a pen and paper, as it is well that the child should rub out and rub out until his eye is satisfied with the word or letter he has written. Of the further stages, little need be said. Secure that the child begins by making perfect letters and is never allowed to make faulty ones, and the rest he will do for himself. As for a good hand, do not hurry him. His handwriting will come by and by out of the character that is in him. But as a child, he cannot be said, strictly speaking, to have character. Set good copies before him and see that he imitates his model dutifully. The writing lesson being not so many lines or a copy, that is, a page of writing, but a single line which is as exactly as possible a copy of the character set. The child may have to write several lines before he succeeds in producing this. Text hand. 
If he write in books with copper plate headlines, which are on the whole to be askewed, discrimination should be exercised in the choice of these. In many of them, the writing is atrocious and the letters are adorned with flourishes which increase the pupil's labor, but by no means improve his style. One word more, do not hurry the child into small hand. It is unnecessary that he should labor much over what is called large hand, but text hand, the medium size, should be continued until he makes the letters with ease. It is much easier for the child to get into an irregular scribble by way of small hand than to get out of it again. In this, as in everything else, the care of the educator must be given, not only to the formation of good, but to the prevention of bad habits. A new handwriting. Some years ago, I heard of a lady who was elaborating by means of the study of an old Italian and other manuscripts, a system of beautiful handwriting, which could be taught to children. I waited patiently, though not without some urgency for the production of this new kind of copybook. The need for such an effort was very great for the distinctly commonplace writing taught from existing copybooks, however painstaking and legible, cannot but have a rather vulgarizing effect, both on the writer and the reader of such manuscript. At last, the lady, Mrs. Robert Bridges, had succeeded in her tedious and difficult undertaking, and this book for teachers will enable them to teach their pupils a style of writing which is pleasant to acquire because it is beautiful to behold. It is surprising how quickly young children even those already confirmed in ugly writing, take to this new handwriting. But Mrs. Bridges' purpose in a new handwriting will be better understood by some passages quoted with her permission from her preface. The accompanying 10 plates are intended chiefly for those who teach writing. A few words, both of apology and explanation are needed to introduce them. I was always interested in handwriting and after making acquaintance with the Ita Italianized Gothic of the 16th century, I consciously altered my hand towards some likeness with its forms and general character. The script happened to please. I was often asked to make alphabets and copies and begged by professional teachers to have such a book as this printed that they might use it in their schools. One can never quite satisfy oneself in the making of models for others to copy, but these plates are very much what I intended, though owing to my inexperience, some of them have suffered in the reproduction. A child must first learn to control his hand and constrain it to obey his eye. At this earliest stage, any simple forms will serve the purpose, and hence it may be further argued that the forms are always indifferent and that full mastery of the hand can be well attained by copying bad models as good. But this can hardly be. The ordinary copybook, the aim of which seems to be to economise the component parts of the letters, cannot train the hand as more varied shapes will. Nor does this uniformity exclusive of beauty offer as good training to the eye. Moreover, I should say that variety and beauty of form are attractive even to little children, and that the attempt to create something which interests them cheers and crowns their stupendous efforts with a pleasure that cannot be looked for in the task of copying monotonous shapes. But whether such a hand as that here shown lends itself as easily as the more uniform model to the development of a quick, useful cursive, I cannot say. And it is possible that the degradations inevitable in the habit of quick writing might produce a mere untidiness, almost the worst reproach of penmanship. Some of the best English hands of today are as good as quick cursive as one can desire and show points of real beauty. But such hands are rare and are only those which have, as we say, character, which probably means that the writer would have done well for himself under any system. 
whereas the average hands, which are the natural outcome of the old copybook writing, degraded by haste, seem to owe their common ugliness to the mean type from which they sprang. And the writers, when they have occasion to write well, find they can do but little better, and only prove that haste was not the real cause of their bad writing. How to use. The method of using Miss Bridges' handwriting, which we find most effectual, is to practice each form on the blackboard from the plate, and later to use pencil, and still later, pen and ink. By and by, the children will be promoted to transcribe little poems, and so on in this very pleasing script. Set headlines are to be avoided, as children fail to use the forms of the headline in their ordinary writing. It is sometimes objected that this rather elaborate and beautiful handwriting will interfere with the characteristic hand. But it seems to me that to have a beautiful instead of a commonplace basis for handwriting is a great gain. 11. Transcription. Value of transcription. The earliest practice in writing proper for children of seven or eight should be not letter writing or dictation, but transcription. Slow and beautiful work for which the new handwriting is to be preferred. Though perhaps some of the more ornate characters may be omitted with advantage. Transcription should be an introduction to spelling. Children should be encouraged to look at the word, see a picture of it with their eyes shut, and then write from memory. Children should transcribe favourite passages. A certain sense of possession and delight may be added to this exercise if children are allowed to choose for transcription their favourite verse in one poem or another. This is better than to write a favourite poem, an exercise which stales on the little people before it is finished. But a book of their own, made up of their own chosen verses, should give them pleasure. Small text hand, double ruled lines. Double ruled lines, small text hand, should be used at first, as children are eager to write very minute small hand. And once they have fallen into this habit, it is not easy to get good writing. A sense of beauty in their writing and in the lines they copy should carry them over this stage of their work with pleasure. Not more than 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour should be given to the early writing lesson. If they are longer, the children get tired and slovenly. Position in writing. For the writing position, children should sit so that light reaches them from the left and the desk or table should be at a comfortable height. It will be a great gain if children were taught from the first to hold the pen between the first and second fingers, steadying it with their thumb. This position avoids the uncomfortable strain on the muscles produced by the unusual way of holding a pen, a strain which causes writer's cramp in later days when there is much writing to be done. The pen should be held in a comfortable position, rather near the point, fingers and thumb somewhat bent, and the hand resting on the paper. The writer should always be allowed to support himself with the left hand on the paper, and should write in an easy position, with bent head and not with stooping figure. It would be unnecessary to say that the flat of the nib should be used if children had not the happy gift for making spider marks with the nib held sideways. In all writing lessons, free use should be made of the blackboard by both teacher and children by way of model and practice. Desks. The best desks I know are those recommended by Dr. Roth Single desks, which may be raised or lowered, moved backwards or forwards, with seat, back and a back pad, and rests for the feet. There may be others as good, even better, in the market, but these seem to answer every purpose. Children's table. For little children, it is a good plan to have a table of the right height made by the house carpenter. 
The top of the table consists of two leaves with hinges. These leaves open in the middle and disclose a sort of box in the space which is often used for a drawer. The table's top itself making the lids of the box. Such a receptacle for the children's books, writing materials, etc. is more easily kept neat by themselves than is an ordinary drawer or box. 12. Spelling and Dictation Of all the mischievous exercises in which children spend their school hours, dictation, as commonly practised, is perhaps the most mischievous. And this because people are slow to understand that there is no part of a child's work at school which some philosophic principle does not underlie. A fertile cause of bad spelling. The common practice is for the teacher to dictate a passage clause by clause, repeating each clause perhaps three or four times under a fire of questions from the writers. Every line has errors in spelling. One, two, three perhaps. The conscientious teacher draws her pencil under these errors or solemnly underlines them with red ink. The children correct in various fashions, sometimes they change books, and each corrects the errors of another, copying the word from the book or from the blackboard. A few benighted teachers still cause children to copy their own error along with the correction, which last is written three or four times learned and spelled to the teacher. The latter is astonished at the pure perversity which causes the same errors to be repeated again and again, notwithstanding all these painstaking efforts. The rationale of spelling. But the fact is, the gift of spelling depends upon the power the eye possesses to take, in a photographic sense, a detailed picture of a word. And this is a power and habit which must be cultivated in children from the first. When they have read cat, they must be encouraged to see the word with their eyes shut. And the same habit will enable them to image thermophili. This picturing of words upon the retina appears to me to be the only royal road to spelling. An error once made and corrected leads to fearful doubt for the rest of one's life as to which was the wrong way and which the right. Most of us are haunted by some such doubt as to whether balance, for instance, should have one L or two. And the doubt is born of a correction. Once the eye sees a misspelt word, that image remains. And if there is also the image of the word spelt right, we are perplexed as to which is which. Now we see why there could not be a more ingenious way of making bad spellers than dictation as it is commonly taught. Every misspelt word is an image in the child's brain not to be obliterated by the right spelling it becomes therefore the teacher's business to prevent false spelling and if an error has been made to hide it away, as it were, so the impression may not be fixed. Steps of a dictation lesson. Dictation lessons conducted in some such way as the following usually result in good spelling. A child of eight or nine prepared a paragraph, older children a page, or two or three pages. The child prepares by himself, by looking at the word he is not sure of, and then seeing it with his eyes shut. Before he begins, the teacher asks what words he thinks will need his attention. He generally knows, but the teacher may point out any word likely to be a cause of stumbling. He lets his teacher know when he is ready. The teacher asks if there are any words he is not sure of. These she puts one by one on the blackboard, letting the child look till he has a picture and then rubbing the word out. If anyone is still doubtful, 
he should be called to put the word he is not sure of on the board. The teacher watching to rub out the word when a wrong letter begins to appear. And again, helping the child get a mental picture. Then the teacher gives out the dictation clause by clause, each clause repeated once. She dictates with a view to the pointing, which the children are expected to put in as they write, but they must not be told comma, semicolon, etc. After this sort of preparation I have described, which takes 10 minutes or less, there is rarely an error in spelling. If there be, it is well worthwhile for the teacher to be on the watch with slips of stamp paper to put over the wrong word that its image may be erased as far as possible. At the end of the lesson, the child should again study the wrong word in his book until he says he is sure of it and should write it correctly on the stamp paper. A lesson of this kind secures the hearty cooperation of children who feel they take their due part in it. And it also prepares them for the second condition of good spelling, which is, much reading combined with the habit of imaging the words as they are read. Illiterate spelling is usually a sign of sparse reading, but sometimes of hasty reading without the habit of seeing the words that are skimmed over. Spelling must not be lost sight of in the children's other studies, though they should not be teased to spell. It is well to write a difficult proper name, for example, on the blackboard in the course of history or geography readings, rubbing the word out when the child says they can see it. The whole secret of spelling lies in the habit of visualising words from memory, and children must be trained to visualise in the course of their reading. They enjoy this way of learning to spell. 13. Composition George Osborne's essay. What a prodigiously well-read and delightful person the Reverend Lawrence Veal was, George's master. He knows everything, Amelia said. He says there is no place in the bar or the Senate that Gregory may not aspire to. Look here, and she went to the piano drawer and drew out a theme of George's composition. This great effort of genius, which is still in the possession of George's mother, is as follows. On selfishness, of all the vices which degrade the human character, selfishness is the most odious and contemptible. An undue love of self leads to the most monstrous crimes and occasions the greatest misfortunes both in states and families. As a selfish man will impoverish his family and often bring them to ruin, so a selfish king brings ruin on his people and often plunges them into war. Example, the selfishness of Achilles, as remarked by the poet Homer, occasioned a thousand woes to the Greeks. Greek writing from Homer, Homer 2a2. The selfishness of the late Napoleon Bonaparte occasioned innumerable wars in Europe and caused him to perish himself in a miserable land, that of St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean. We see by these examples that we are not consult of our own interest and ambition, but that we are to consider the interests of others as well as our own. George S. Osborne, Athene House, 24 April, 1827. Think of him, George was 10, writing such a hand and quoting Greek too at his age, the delighted mother said. As well might Mrs. George Sedley be delighted. Would not many a mother today triumph in such a literary effort? What can Thackeray be laughing at? Or does he, in truth, give us this little theme as a tour de force? An educational futility. I think this great moral teacher here throws down the gauntlet in challenge of an educational futility which is practised and an educational fallacy which is accepted, even in the 20th century. 
That futility is the exaction of original composition from schoolboys and schoolgirls. The proper function of the mind of the young scholar is to collect material for the generalizations of afterlife. If a child is asked to generalize, that is, to write an essay upon some abstract theme, a double wrong is done to him. He is brought up before a stone wall by being asked to do what is impossible to him, and that is discouraging. But a worse moral injury happens to him in that, having no thought of his own to offer on the subject, he puts together such tags of commonplace thought as have come in his way and offers the whole as his composition, an effort which puts a strain upon his conscience while it piques his vanity. In these days, masters do not consciously put their hand to the work of their pupils, as did that prodigiously well-read and delightful master who had, an who had the educating of George Osborne. But perhaps without knowing it, they give the ideas which the cunning schoolboy seizes to stick in the essay he hates. Sometimes they do more. They deliberately teach children how to build a sentence and how to bind sentences together. Lessons in composition. Here is a series of preliminary exercises, or rather a part of series, which number 40, intended to help a child to write an essay on an umbrella from a book of the hour proceeding from one of the best publishing houses. Step one. One, what are you? Two, how did you get your name? Three, who uses you? Four, what were you once? Five, what were you like then? Six, where were you obtained or found? Seven, of what stuff or materials are you made of? Eight, from what sources do you come? Nine, what are your parts? 10, are you made, grown or fitted together? Step two, I am an umbrella and I am used by many people, young and old. I get my name from a word which means a shade. The stick came perhaps from America and is quite smooth, even and polished so that the metal ring may slide easily up and down the stick. My parts are a frame and a cover. My frame consists of a stick about a yard long, wires and a sliding metal band. At the lower end of the stick is a steel ferrule or ring. This keeps the end from wearing away when I am used in walking. Step three. Now use it, is, are, and was instead of I, have, my, and am. Exercise. Now write out your own description of it. Such teaching a public danger. And this is the work intended for standards six and seven. That is to say, this kind of thing is the final literary effort to be exacted from children in our elementary schools. The two volumes, I quote from near the end of the second and more advanced volume, are not to be gibbeted as exceptionally bad. A few years ago, the appalling discovery was made that both in secondary and elementary schools, composition was dreadfully defective and therefore badly taught. Since then, many volumes have been produced, more or less, on the lines indicated in the above citation. And distinguished publishers have not perceived that to offer to the public, with the sanction of their name, works of this sterilising and injur injurious character is an offence against society. The body of a child is sacred to the eye of the law, but his intellectual powers may be annihilated on such starvation diet as this, and nothing said. The worst of it is, both authors and publishers in every case act upon the fallacy that well-intentioned effort 
is always excusable, if not praiseworthy. They do not perceive that no effort is permissible towards the education of children without an intelligent conception, both of children and of what is meant by education. Composition comes by nature. In fact, lessons on composition should follow the model of that famous essay on snakes in Ireland. There are none. For children under nine, the question of composition resolves itself into that of narration, varied by some such simple exercise as to write a part and narrate a part, or write the whole account of a walk they have taken, a lesson they have studied, or of some simple matter they know. Before they are 10, children who have been in the habit of using books will write good, vigorous English with ease and freedom. That is, if they have not been hampered by instructions. It is well for them not to even learn rules for the placing of full stops and capitals until they notice how these things occur in their books. Our business is to provide children with material in their lessons and leave the handling of such material to themselves. If we would believe it, composition is as natural as jumping and running to children who have been allowed due use of books. They should narrate in the first place and they will compose later readily enough, but they should not be taught composition. 14. Bible Lessons Children enjoy the Bible. We are apt to believe that children cannot be interested in the Bible unless its passages be watered down, turned into the slipshod English we prefer to offer them. Here is a suggestive anecdote of the childhood of Mrs. Harrison, one of the pair of little Quaker maidens introduced to us in the autobiography of Mary Howitt, the better known of the sisters. One day she found her way into a lumber room. There she caught sight of an old Bible and turning over its yellow leaves, she came upon words that she had not heard at the usual morning readings. The opening chapters of St. Luke, which her father objected to read aloud, and the closing chapter of Revelation. The exquisite picture of the great child's birth in one chapter and the beauty of the description of the New Jerusalem in the other were seized upon by the eager little girl of six years old with a rapture which she used to say no novel in after years ever produced. And here is a mention of the child of five. The little ones read every day the events of Holy Week with me. Z is inexpressibly interested in his deep reverent interest, almost excitement. We are probably quite incapable of measuring the religious receptivity of children. Nevertheless, their fitness to apprehend the deep things of God is a fact with which we are called to deal prudently and to deal reverently. And that because as none can appreciate more fully than the Darwinian, the attitude of thought and feeling in which you place a child is the vital factor in his education. Should know the Bible text. Children between the ages of six and nine should get a considerable knowledge of the Bible text. By nine, they should have read the simple and suitable narrative portions of the Old Testament and say two of the Gospels. The Old Testament should, for various reasons, be read to children. The Gospel stories, they might read for themselves as soon as they can read them beautifully. It is a mistake to use parentheses of the text. A fine roll of Bible English appeals to children with a compelling music, and they will probably retain through life their first conception of the Bible scenes, and also the very words in which these scenes are portrayed. This is a great possession. Half the clever talk we hear today and half the uneasiness which underlies this talk are due to a thorough and perfect ignorance of the Bible text. The points of assault are presented to men's minds naked and jagged, without atmosphere, 
Perspective, proportion, until the Bible comes to mean for many the speaking of Balaam's ass or the standing still of the son at Joshua's bidding. But let the imaginations of children be stored with the pictures, their minds nourished upon the words of the gradually unfolding story of scriptures, and they will come to look out upon a wide horizon within which persons and events take shape in their due place and in due proportion. By degrees, they will see that the world is a stage whereon the goodness of God is continually striving with the willfulness of man, that some heroic men take sides with God, and that others, foolish and headstrong, oppose themselves to him. The fire of enthusiasm will kindle in their breast, and the children too will take their side without much exhortation or any thought or talk of spiritual experience. Essential and accidental truth. As for whether such and such a narrative be a myth or a parable or a circumstance that has actually occurred, such questions do not affect the sincere mind of a child because they have nothing to do with the main issues. It is quite well to bring before children in the course of their Bible readings, whatever new light modern research puts in our way. The more we can help bring them in this way, the more vivid and real will Bible teaching become to them. But this grace, at any rate, the children may claim at our hands that they shall not be disturbed by questions of authenticity in their Bible reading any more than in their reading of English history. Let them hear the story of the Garden of Eden, for example, as it stands. Just so, we might even let them have the story of the man who went fishing and found a goodly pearl. And this, because the thing that matters in both stories is the essential truths they embody, and not the mere accidents of time and place. It is conceivable that the pearl of great price was matter of current talk at the time, a so-called fact seized upon by our Lord to make it the vehicle for essential truth. If we believe it, the minds of children are perhaps more fit than our own to appropriate and deal with truth. By and by, they will perceive and discard, if necessary, the accidental circumstances with which the truth is clothed upon. But let us be very chary of our own action let us remember that neither we nor the children can bear the white light of naked truth. That if, for example, we succeed in destroying the clothing that covers the story of the first fall, the tree and its fruit, the tempting serpent, the yielding woman, we have no other clothing at hand for the fundamental truths of responsibility, temptation, sin. And once uncovered with no vesture, which we can lay hold upon, the truths themselves will assuredly slip from our grasp. We need not be at pains to discriminate in teaching children Bible narratives between essential and accidental truths. The truth which interprets our own lives and that which concerns only the time, place and circumstances proper to the narrative. The children themselves will discern and keep fast hold of the essential, while the merely accidental slips from their memory as from ours. Therefore, let the minds of young children be well stored with the beautiful narratives of the earlier portions of the Old Testament and of the Gospels. But, in order that these stories may be always fresh and delightful to them, Care must be taken lest Bible teaching stale upon their minds. Children are more capable of being bored than even we ourselves, and many a revolt has been brought about by the undue rubbing in of the Bible in season and out of season, even in nursery days. But we are considering not the religious life of children, but their education by lessons and their Bible lessons should help them to realize in early days that the knowledge of God is the principal knowledge and therefore that their Bible lessons are their chief lessons. 
Method of Bible Lessons. The method of such lessons is very simple. Read aloud to the children a few verses covering, if possible, an episode. Read reverently, carefully, and with just expression. Then require the children to narrate what they have listened to as nearly as possible in the words of the Bible. It is curious how readily they catch the rhyme of the majestic and simple Bible English. Then talk the narrative over with them in light of research and criticism. Let the teaching, moral and spiritual, reach them without much personal application. I know of no better help in the teaching of young children than we get in Canon Patterson Smythe's Bible for the Young. Mr. Smythe brings both modern criticism and research to bear so that children taught from his little manuals will not be startled to be told that the world was not made in six days and at the same time they will be very sure that the world was made by God. The moral and spiritual teaching in these manuals is on broad and convincing lines. It is rather a good plan occasionally to read out Mr. Smythe's lessons on the subject after the Bible passage has been narrated. Children are more ready to appropriate lessons that are not directly leveled at themselves, while the teacher makes the teaching her own by interest with which she reads the pictures and other illustrations she shows and her conversational remarks. Picture illustrations. The pictures in the illustrated New Testament are at the same time reverent and actual, an unusual combination, and children enjoy them greatly. It would be well for them to have only the penny gospel they are reading, but it should perhaps be protected and honoured by an embroidered cover. A tattered Bible is not a wholesome sight for children. The Holy Gospels with illustrations from the Old Masters published by the SPCK is admirable. The study of such pictures as are here reproduced should be a valuable part of a child's education. It is no slight thing to realise how the nativity and the visit of the wise men filled the imagination of the early masters, and with what exceeding reverence and delight they dwelt upon every detail of the sacred story. This sort of impression is not to be had from any up-to-date treatment or up-to-date illustrations, and the child who gets it in early days will have a substratum of reverent feeling upon which should rest his faith but it is well to let the pictures tell their own tale. The children should study a subject quietly for a few minutes and then, the picture being removed, say what they have seen in it. It will be found that they miss no little reverent or suggestive detail which the artist has thought well to include. The various RTS publications issued in the series of By Paths of Bible Knowledge will be found very helpful by the teacher as illustrating modern research, notably Professor Sacy's Fresh Light from Ancient Monuments and Budger's Dwellers on the Nile. Bible recitations. The learning by heart of Bible passages should begin while the children are quite young, six or seven. It is a delightful thing to have a memory stored with beautiful, comforting and inspiring passages. And we cannot tell when and how this manner of seed may spring up, grow or bear fruit. But the learning of the parable of the prodigal son, for example, should not be laid on the children as a burden. The whole parable should be read to them in a whole to bring out its beauty and tenderness. And then, day by day, the teacher should recite a short passage, perhaps two or three verses, saying it over some three or four times until the children think they know it. Then, but not before, let them recite the passage. Next day, the children will recite what they have already learned and so on, until they are able to say the whole parable. 15. Arithmetic. 
educative value of arithmetic. Of all his early studies, perhaps none is more important to the child as a means of education than that of arithmetic. That he should do sums is of comparatively small importance, but the use of those functions which summing calls into play is a great part of education. So much so that the advocates of mathematics and of language as instruments of education have, until recently, divided the field pretty equally between them. The practical value of arithmetic to persons in every class of life goes without remark. But the use of study in practical life is the least of its uses. The chief value of arithmetic, like that of the higher mathematics, lies in the training it affords to the reasoning powers and in the habits of insight. Readiness, accuracy, intellectual truthfulness it engenders. There is no one subject in which good teaching affects more, as there is none in which slovenly teaching has more mischievous results. Multiplication does not produce the right answer, so the boy tries division. That again fails, but subtraction may get him out of the bog. There is no must be to him. He does not see that one process and one process only can give the required result. Now a child who does not know what rule to apply to a simple problem within his grasp has been ill-taught from the first, although he may produce slatefuls of quite right sums in multiplication or long division. Problems within the child's grasp. How is this insight, this exercise of the reasoning powers to be secured? Engage the child upon little problems within his comprehension from the first, rather than upon set sums. The young governess delights to set a noble long division sum, 953, 783, 465 divided by 873, which shall fill the child's slate and keep him occupied for a good half hour. And when it is finished, and the child is finished too, done up with the unprofitable labour, the sum is not right after all. The two last figures in the quotient are wrong, and the remainder is false. But he cannot do it again. He must not be discouraged by being told it is wrong. So, nearly right is the verdict. A judgment inad inadmissible in arithmetic. Instead of this laborious task, which gives no scope for mental effort and in which he goes to see at last from sheer want of attention, say to him, Mr. Jones sent 607 and Mr. Stevens 819 apples to be divided among the 27 boys at school on Monday. How many apples apiece did they get? Here he must ask himself certain questions. How many apples altogether? How shall I find out? Then I must divide the apples into 27 heaps to find out each boy's share. That is to say, the child perceives what rules he must apply to get the required information. He is interested. The work goes on briskly. The sum is done in no time and is probably right because the attention of the child is concentrated on his work. Care must be taken to give the child such problems as he can work, but yet which are difficult enough to cause him some little mental effort. Demonstrate. The next point is to demonstrate everything demonstrable. The child may learn the multiplication table and do a subtraction sum without any insight into the rationale of either. He may even become a good arithmetician, applying rules aptly without seeing the reason of them. But arithmetic becomes an elementary mathematical training only insofar as the reason why of every process is clear to the child. Two plus two equals four is a self-evident fact, admitting of little demonstration, 
but 4 times 7 equals 28 may be proved. He has a bag of beans, places four rows with seven beans in a row, adds the rows, thus seven and seven are 14, and seven are 21, and seven are 28. How many sevens in 28? Four. Therefore, it is right to say four times seven equals 28. And the child sees that multiplication is, the on, is only a short way of doing addition. A bag of beans, counters or buttons should be used in all the early arithmetic lessons. And the child should be able to work with these freely and even to add, subtract, multiply and divide mentally without the aid of buttons or beans before he is set to do sums on his slate. He may arrange an addition table with his beans, thus two beans plus one bean equals three beans, two beans plus two beans equal four beans, two beans plus three beans equal five beans, and be exercised upon it until he can first without counting and then without looking at the beans that two plus seven equals nine, etc. Thus with three, four, five, each of the digits, as he learns each line of his addition table, he is exercised upon imaginary objects. Four apples and nine apples, four nuts and six nuts, etc. And lastly, with abstract numbers. Six plus five, six plus eight. A subtraction table is worked out simultaneously with the addition table. As he works out each line of additions, he goes over the same ground, only taking away one bean or two beans instead of adding, until he is able to answer quite readily two from seven, two from five. After working out each line of additional subtraction, he may put it on his slate with the proper signs, that is, if he have learned to make figures. It will be found that it requires a much greater mental effort on the child's part to grasp the idea of subtraction than that of addition. And the teacher must be content to go slowly. One finger from four fingers, one nut from three nuts, and so forth, until he knows what he is about. When the child can add and subtract numbers pretty freely up to 20, the multiplication and division tables may be worked out with beans as far as 6 times 12, that is twice 6 are 12, will be ascertained by means of two rows of beans, six beans in a row. When the child can say readily without even a glance at his beans, 2 times 8 equals 16, 2 times 7 equals 14, etc., he will take four, six, eight, ten, twelve beans and divide them into groups of two. Then how many twos in ten, in twelve, in twenty? And so on with each line of the multiplication table that he works out. Problems. Now he is ready for more ambitious problems. Thus, a boy had twice ten apples. How many heaps of four could he make? He will be able to work out with promiscuous numbers as seven plus five minus three. If he must use beans to get his answer, let him, but encourage him to work with imaginary beans as a step towards working with abstract numbers. Carefully graduated teaching and daily mental effort on the child's part at this early stage may be the means of developing real mathematical power and will certainly promote the habits of concentration and effort of mind. Notation. When the child is able to work pretty freely with small numbers, a serious difficulty must be faced, upon his thorough mastery of which will depend his apprehension of arithmetic as a science. In other words, will depend the educational value of all the sums he may henceforth do. He must be made to understand our system of notation. Here as before, it is best to begin with the concrete. Let the child get the idea of 10 units in 110 
after he has mastered the more easily demonstrable idea of 12 pence in one shilling. Let him have a heap of pennies, say 50. Point out the inconvenience of carrying such a weighty money to the shops. Lighter money is used, shillings. How many pennies is a shilling's worth? How many shillings then might he have for his 50 pennies? He divides them into heaps of 12 and finds that he has four such heaps and two pennies over. That is to say, 50 pence are, or are worth, four shillings and two pence. I buy 10 pounds of biscuits at five pence a pound. They cost 50 pence. But the shopman gives me a bill for 4S2D. Show the child how to put down the pennies, which are worth least, to the right, the shillings, which are worth more, to the left. When the child is able to work freely with shillings and pence and to understand that two in the right-hand column of figures is pence and two in the left-hand column shillings, introduce him to the notion of tens and units, being content to work very gradually. Tell him of uncivilised people who can only count so far as five, who say, five, five beasts in the forest, five, five fish in the river, when they wish to express an immense number. We can count so far that we might count all day long for years without coming to the end of the numbers we might name. But after all, we have very few numbers to count with and very few figures to express them by. We have but nine figures and a naught. We take the first figure and the naught to express another number, 10. But after that, we must begin again until we get two tens. Then again, till we reach three tens and so on. We call two tens 20, three tens 30, because T, tig, means 10. But if I see figure four, how am I to know whether it means four tens or four ones? By a very simple plan, the tens have a plan of their own. If you see figure six in the 10 place, you know it means 60. The tens are always put behind the units. When you see two figures standing side by side, thus, 55, the left-hand figure stands for so many tens. That is, the second five stands for 10 times as many as the first. Let the child work with tens and units only until he has mastered the idea of the tenfold value of the second figure to the left, and would laugh at the folly of writing seven in the second column of figures, knowing that thereby it becomes 70. Then he is ready for the same sort of drill in hundreds and picks up the new idea readily if the principle have been made clear to him that each remove to the left means a tenfold increase in the value of a number. Meantime, set him no sums. Let him never work with figures, the notation of which is beyond him. And when he comes to carry in an addition or multiplication sum, let him not say he carries two or three, but two tens or three hundreds, as the case may be. Weighing and measuring. If the child do not get the ground under his feet at this stage, he works arithmetic ever after by rule of thumb. On the same principle, let him learn weights and measures by measuring and weighing. Let him have scales and weights, sand or rice, paper and twine and weigh and do up in perfectly made parcels, ounces, pounds, etc. The parcels, although they are not arithmetic, are educative and afford considerable exercise of judgment as well as of neatness, deftness and quickness. In like manner, let him work with foot rule and yard measure and draw up his tables for himself. Let him not only measure and weigh everything about him that admits of such treatment, but let him use his judgment on questions of measure and weight. 
How many yards long is the tablecloth? How many feet long and broad a map or picture? What does he suppose a book weighs that is to go by parcel post? The sort of readiness to be gained thus is valuable in the affairs of life and, if only for that reason, should be cultivated in the child. While engaged in measuring and weighing concrete quantities, the scholar is prepared to take in his first idea of a fraction, half a pound, a quarter of a yard, etc. Arithmetic, a means of training. Arithmetic is valuable as a means of training children in habits of strict accuracy. But the ingenuity which makes this exact science tend to foster slipshod habits of mind, a disregard of truth and common honesty is worthy of admiration. The copying, prompting, telling, helping over difficulties, working with an eye to the answer which he knows that are allowed in arithmetic lessons under an inferior teacher are enough to vitiate any child. And quite as bad as these is the habit of allowing that a sum is nearly right, two figures wrong, and so on, and letting the child work it over again. Pronounce a sum wrong or right. It cannot be something between the two. That which is wrong must remain wrong. The child must not be let to run away with the notion that wrong can be mended into right. The future is before him. He may get the next sum right, and the wise teacher will make it her business to see that he does, and that he starts with a new hope. But the wrong sum must be let alone. Therefore his progress must be carefully graduated. But there is no subject in which the teacher has a more delightful consciousness of drawing out from day to day new power in the child. Do not offer him a crutch. It is in his own power he must go. Give him short sums in words rather than in figures and excite in him the enthusiasm which produces concentrated attention and rapid work. Let his arithmetic lesson be to the child a daily exercise in clear thinking and rapid careful execution. His mental growth will be as obvious as the sprouting of seedlings in the spring. The ABC Arithmetic Instead of entering further into the subject of teaching of elementary arithmetic, I should like to refer the reader to the ABC Arithmetic by Messrs Sonnenschein and Nesbitt. The authors found their method upon the following passage from Mill's Logic. The fundamental truths of the science of number all rest on the evidence of sense. They are proved by showing to our eyes and our fingers that any given number of objects, ten balls for example, may by separation and rearrangement exhibit to our senses all the different sets of numbers the sum of which is equal to ten. All the improved methods of teaching arithmetic to children proceed on a knowledge of this fact. All who wish to carry the child's mind along with them in learning arithmetic, all who wish to teach numbers and not mere ciphers, now teach it through the evidence of the senses in the manner we have described. Here we may, I think, trace the solitary source of weakness in a surpassingly excellent manual. It is quite, quite true that the fundamental truths of the science of number all rest on the evidence of sense. But having used eyes and fingers upon 10 balls or 20 balls, upon 10 nuts or leaves or sheep or whatnot, the child has formed the association of a given number with objects and is able to conceive of the association of various other num numbers with objects. In fact, he begins to think in numbers and not in objects. That is, he begins mathematics. Therefore, I incline to think that an elaborate system of staves, cubes, etc., instead of tens, hundreds, thousands, errs by embarrassing the child's mind with too much teaching 
and by making the illustration occupy a more prominent place than the thing illustrated. Dominoes, beans, graphic figures drawn on the blackboard and the like are, on the other hand, aids to the child when it is necessary for him to conceive of a great number with the material of a small one. But to see a symbol of the great numbers and to work with such a symbol are quite different matters. With the above trifling exception, which does not interfere at all with the use of the books, nothing can be more delightful than the careful analysis of numbers and the beautiful graduation of the work, only one difficulty at a time, being presented to the mind. The examples and the little problems could only have been invented by writers in sympathy with children. I advise the reader who is interested in the teaching of arithmetic to turn to Mr. Sonnenschneid's paper on the teaching of arithmetic in elementary schools in one of the volumes published by the Board of Education. Preparation for mathematics. In the 40s and 50s, it was currently held that the continual sight of the outward and visible science, geometrical forms and figures, should beget the inward and spiritual grace of mathematical genius, or at any rate, of an inclination to mathematics. But the educationalists of those days forgot when they gave children boxes of form and stuck up cubes, hexagons, pentagons and whatnot in every available schoolroom space the immense capacity for being bored which is common to us all and is far more strongly developed in children with than in grown-up people. The objects which bore us or the persons who bore us appear to wear a bald place in the mind and thought turns from them with sick aversion. Dickens showed us the pathos of it in the schoolroom of the little Gradgrinds, which was bountifully supplied with objects of uncompromising outline. Ruskin more genially exposed the fallacy. No doubt geometric forms abound, the skeletons of which living beauty in contour and gesture, in hill and plant, is the covering and the skeleton is beautiful and wonderful to the mind which has already entered within the portals of geometry. But children should not be presented with the skeleton, but with the living forms which clothe it. Besides, is it not an inverse method to familiarise the child's eye with patterns made by his compasses or stitched upon his card in the hope that the form will beget the idea? For the novice, it is probably the rule that the idea must beget the form and any suggestion of an idea from a form comes only to the initiated. I do not think that any direct preparation for mathematics is desirable. The child who has been allowed to think and not compelled to cram hails the new study with delight when the due time for it arrives. The reason why mathematics are a great study is because there exists in the normal mind an affinity and capacity for this study. And too great an elaboration, whether of teaching or of preparation, has, I think, a tendency to take the edge off this manner of intellectual interest. 16. Natural Philosophy A Basis of Facts of the teaching of natural philosophy, I will only remind the reader of what was said in an earlier chapter, that there is no part of a child's education more important than that he should lay by his own observation a wide basis of facts towards scientific knowledge in the future. He must live hours daily in the open air and as far as possible in the country, must look and touch and listen must be quick to note, consciously, every peculiarity of habit or structure, in beast, bird or insect, the manner of growth and fru fructation of every plant. He must be accustomed to ask why. Why does the wind blow? Why does the river flow? 
why is a leaf bud sticky? And do not hurry to answer his questions for him. Let him think his difficulties out so far as his small experience will carry him. Above all, when you come to the rescue, let it not be in the cut and dried formula of some miserable little textbook. Let him have all the insight available and you will find that on many scientific questions, the child may be brought at once to the level of modern thought. Do not embarrass him with too much scientific nomenclature. If he discover for himself, helped perhaps by a leading question or two, by comparing an oyster and his cat, that some animals have backbones and some have not, it is less important that he should learn the terms vertebrate and invertebrate than that he should class the animals he meets with according to this difference. Eyes and no eyes. The method of this sort of instruction is shown in evenings at home where eyes and no eyes go for a walk. No eyes comes home bored. He has seen nothing, been interested in nothing while eyes is all agog to discuss a hundred things that have interested him. As I have already tried to point out, to get this sort of instruction for himself is simply the nature of a child. The business of the parent is to afford him abundant and varied opportunities and to direct his observations so that, knowing little of the principles of scientific classification, he is unconsciously furnishing himself with the materials for such classification. It is needless to repeat what has already been said on this subject, but indeed the future of the man or woman depends very largely on the store of real knowledge gathered and the habits of intelligent observation acquired by the child. Think you, says Mr. Herbert Spencer, that the rounded rock marked with parallel scratches calls up as much poetry in an ignorant mind as in the mind of a geologist who knows that over this rock a glacier slid many years ago. The truth is that those who have never entered on scientific pursuits are blind to most of the poetry by which they are surrounded. Whoever has not in youth collected plants and insects knows not half the halo of interest which lanes and hedgerows can assume. Principles. In this connection, I should like to recommend The Sciences by Mr. Holden. America comes to the force with a school book after my own heart. The Sciences is a forbidding title, but since the era of Joyce's scientific dialogues, I have met with nothing on the same lines which makes so fit an approach to the sensible and intelligent mind of a child. This is what we may call a first-hand book. The knowledge has, of course, all been acquired, but then it has been assimilated. And Mr. Holden writes freely out of his own knowledge, both of his subject matter and of his readers. The book has been thrown into the form of conversations between children, simple conversations without padding. About 300 topics are treated of sand dunes, back ice, Herculaneum, dredging, hurricanes, echoes, the prism, the diving bell, the Milky Way, and shall I say everything else? But the amazing skill of the author is shown in the fact that there is nothing scrappy and nothing hurried in the treatment of any topic. But each falls naturally and easily under the head of, the, of some principle which it elucidates. Many simple experiments are included, which the author insists shall be performed by the children themselves. I venture to quote from the singularly wise preface, Avade Mecum, for teachers. The object of the present volume is to present chapters to be read in school or at home that shall materially widen the outlook of American school children in the domain of science and of the applications of science to the arts and to daily life. It is in no sense a textbook, 
although the fundamental principles underlying the sciences treated are here laid down. Its main object is to help the child to understand the material world about him. To be comprehended by children. All natural phenomena are orderly. They are governed by law. They are not magical. They are comprehended by someone. Why not by the child himself? It is not possible to explain every detail of a locomotive to a young pupil, but it is perfectly practicable to explain its principles so that this machine, like others, becomes a mere special case of certain well-understood general laws. The general plan of the book is to awaken the imagination, to convey useful knowledge, to open the doors toward wisdom. Its special aim is to stimulate observation and to excite a living and lasting interest in the world that lies about us. The sciences of astronomy, physics, chemistry, meteorology and physiography are treated as fully and as deeply as the conditions permit. And the lessons that they teach are enforced by examples taken from familiar and important things. In astronomy, for example, emphasis is laid upon phenomena that the child himself can observe, and he is instructed how to go about it. The rising and setting of the stars, the phases of the moon, the uses of the telescope are explained in simple words. The mystery of these and other matters is not magical, as the child at first supposes. It is to deeper mysteries that his attention is here directed. Mere phenomena are treated as special cases of very general laws. The same process is followed in the exposition of other sciences. Familiar phenomena like those of steam or shadows, of reflected light, of musical instruments, of echoes, etc are referred to their fundamental causes. Whenever it is desirable, simple experiments are described and fully illustrated, and all such experiments can very well be repeated in the schoolroom. The volume is the result of a sincere belief that much can be done to aid young children to comprehend the material world in which they live and of a desire to have a part in a work so very well worth doing. I cannot help quoting also in this connection from an article by Reverend H. H. Moore dealing with a forgotten pioneer of a rational education and his experiment. This pioneer was the Reverend Richard Dawes, at one time rector of King's Somborne Parish, Hampshire, who in 1841 worked out the problem of rational education in an agricultural village in which he found the population unusually ignorant and debased. The whole story is of great interest, but our concern is with the question of natural philosophy, the staple of the teaching given in this school. As taught in a village school, Mr. Dawes thus explains his object. I aim at teaching what would be profitable and interesting to persons in the position in life which the children were likely to occupy. I aim at their being taught what may be called philosophy of common things, of everyday life. They were shown how much there is that is interesting and what it is advantageous for them to know in connection with the natural objects which, with which they are familiar. They had explained to them and were made acquainted with the principles of a variety of natural phenomena, as well as the principles and construction of various instruments of a useful kind. A practical turn was given to everything. The uses and fruits of the knowledge they were acquiring were never lost sight of. A list of some of the subjects included in this kind of teaching will be the best commentary on Mr. Dawes' scheme. Some of the properties of air, explaining how its pressure enabled them to pump water up, to amuse themselves with squirts and pop guns, to suck up water through a straw, explaining also the principles and construction of a barometer, the common pump, the diving bell, a pair of bellows, that air expands by heat, 
shown by placing a half-blown bladder near the fire when the wrinkles disappear. Why the chimney spokes sometimes rises easily in the air, sometimes not. Why there is a drought up the chimney or under the door or toward the fire. Air as a vehicle of sound and why the flash of a distant gun fired is seen before the report is heard. How to calculate the distance of a thunderstorm. The difference in the speeds at which different materials conduct sound. Water and its properties its solid, fluid and vaporous state, why water pipes are burst by frozen frost, why ice forms and floats on the surface of ponds and not at the bottom, why the kettle lid jumps up when the water is boiling on the fire, the uses to which the power of steam is applied, the gradual evolution of the steam engine shown by models and diagrams, how their clothes are dried and why they feel cold sitting in damp clothes. Why a damp bed is so dangerous. Why one body floats on water and another sinks. The different densities of sea and fresh water. Why on going into the school on a cold morning, they sometimes see a quantity of water on the glass and why on the inside and not on the outside. Why on a frosty day their breath is visible as vapour, the substances water holds in solution, and how their drinking water is affected by the kind of soil through which it has passed. Dew, its value, and the conditions necessary for its formation. Placing equal proportions of dry wool on gravel, glass, and on the grass, and weighing them the next morning. Heat and its properties. How it is that the blacksmith can fit iron hoops so firmly on the wheels of carts and barrows. What precautions have to be taken in laying the iron rails of railways and in building iron bridges, etc. What materials are good and what bad conductors of heat? Why at the same temperature some feel colder to our touch than others? Why a glass sometimes breaks when hot water is poured into it? and why thick or thin glass would be more liable to crack. Why water can be made to boil in a paper kettle or an eggshell without it being burned. The metals, their sources, properties and uses, mode of separating from the ores. Light and its properties, illustrated by prisms, etc. Adaption of the eye, causes of long and short sightedness. The mechanical principles of the tools more commonly used, the spade, the plough, the axe, the lever, etc. It may surprise some who read carefully the above list that such subjects should have been taught to the children of a rural elementary school. But it is an undeniable fact that they were taught in King's Somborn School and so successfully that the children were both interested and benefited by the teaching. Mr. Dawes, in answer to the objection that such subjects are above the comprehension of the young, said, The distinguishing mark of nature's laws is their extreme simplicity. It may doubtless require intellect of a higher order to make the discovery of these laws. Yet, once evolved, they are within the capacity of a child. In short, the principles of natural philosophy are the principles of common sense, and if taught in a simple and common sense way, they will be speedily understood and eagerly attended to by the children. And it will be found that with pupils of even from 10 to 12 years of age, much may be done towards forming habits of observation and inquiry. Such a fact, I think, suggests some valuable practical lessons for those who have the responsibility of deciding what subjects to include in an educational system for children. In reading of this remarkable experiment, we feel that we must at once secure a man, all informed like the late Dean Dawes, to teach our own Jack and Elsie. But it is something to realise what these young persons should know and Mr. Holden has done a great deal for us. Some of the chapters in the sciences may be beyond children under nine, 
but they will be able to master a good deal. One thing is to be borne in mind. Nothing should be done without its due experiment. By the way, our old friend Joyce's scientific dialogues, if it is still to be had, describes a vast number of easy and interesting experiments which children can work for themselves. 16. Geography Geography is, to my mind, a subject of high educational value, though not because it affords the means of scientific training. Geography does present its problems, and these are the most interesting, and does afford materials for classification. But it is physical geography only which falls within the definition of a science. And even that is rather a compendium of the results of several sciences than a science itself. But the peculiar value of geography lies in its fitness to nourish the mind with ideas and to furnish the imagination with pictures. Herein lies the educational value of geography. As commonly taught. Now, how is the subject commonly taught? The child learns the names of the capital cities of Europe, or of the rivers of England, or of the mountain summits of Scotland, from some miserable textbook with length in miles and height in feet, and population finding the names on his map or not, according as the teacher is more or less up to her work. Poor little fellow, the lesson is hard work to him. But as far as education goes, that is, the developing of power, the furnishing of the mind, he would be better employed in watching the process of a fly across the window pane. But, you will say, geography has a further use than this strictly educative one. Everybody wants the sort of information which the geography lesson should afford. That is true, and is to be borne in mind in the schoolroom. The child's geography lesson should furnish just the sort of information which grown-up people care to possess. Now, do think how unreasonable we are in this matter. Nothing will persuade us to read a book of travel unless it be interesting, graphic, with the spice of personal adventure. Even when we are going about with Murray in hand, we skip the dry facts and figures and read the suggestive pictorial scraps. These are the sorts of things we like to know, and remember with ease. But none of this pleasant padding for the poor child, if you please. Do not let him have pictorial sentences that he may dream over. Facts, names and figures, these are the pabulum for him. Geography should be interesting. But, you say, this sort of knowledge, though it may be a labour for the child to acquire it, is useful in afterlife. Not a bit of it. And for this reason, it has never been really received by the brain at all, has never got further than the floating nebula of mere verbal memory of which I have already had occasion to speak. Most of us have gone through a good deal of drudgery in the way of geography lessons. But how much do we remember? Just the pleasant bits we heard from travelled friends about the Rhine or Paris or Venice or bits from the voyages of Captain Cook or other pleasant tales of travel and adventure. We begin to see the lines we must go upon in teaching geography. For educative purposes, the child must learn such geography and in such a way that his mind shall thereby be, a, be stored with ideas, his imagination with images for practical purposes. He must learn such geography only as the nature of his mind considered he will be able to remember. In other words, he must learn what interests him. The educative and the practical run in one groove and the geography lesson becomes the most charming occupation of the child's day. How to begin. But how to begin. In the first place, the child gets his rudimentary notions of geography as he gets his first notions of natural science in those long hours out of doors of which we have already seen the importance. A pool fed by a mere cutting in the fields will explain the nature of a lake, 
will carry the child to the lovely lakes of the Alps, to Livingston's great African lake, in which he delighted to see his children paidling, his own children paidling in his own lake. In this connection will come a great deal of pleasant talk about places, pictorial geography, until the child knows by name and nature the great rivers and mountains, deserts and plains, the cities and countries of the world. At the same time, he gets his first notions of a map from a rude sketch, a mere few lines and dots done with pencil and paper, or better still, with a stick in the sand or gravel. This crooked line is the Rhine, but you must imagine the rafts and the island with the mouse tower and the nun's island and the rest. Here are the hills with their ruined castles. Now on this side, now on that. This dot is Cologne, etc. Especially let these talks cover all the home scenery and interests you are acquainted with, so that by and by when he looks at the map of England, he finds a score of familiar names which suggest landscapes to him, places where his mother has been, the woody flowery islets of the Thames, the smooth Sussex Downs, delightful to run and roll upon, with soft carpet of turf and nodding harebells, the York or Devon Moors, with bilberries and heather, and always give him a rough sketch map of the route you took in a given journey. What next? Give him next intimate knowledge with the fullest details of any country or region of the world, any county or district of his own country. It is not necessary that he should learn at this stage what is called the geography of the countries of Europe, the continents of the world, mere strings of names for the most part. He may learn these, but it is tolerably certain that he will not remember them but let him be at home in any single region. Let him see with the mind's eye, the people at their work and at their play, the flowers and fruits in their seasons, the beasts, each in its habitat. And let him see all sympathetically, that is, let him follow the adventures of a traveler, and he knows more, is better furnished with ideas than if he had learned all the names on all the maps. The way of this kind of teaching is very simple and obvious. Read to him or read for him, that is read bit by bit and tell as you read Hartwig's Tropical World, the same author's Polar World, Livingston's Missionary Travels, Mrs. Bishop's Unbeaten Tracks in Japan. In fact, any interesting well-written book of travel, but it may be necessary to leave out a good deal but every illustrative anecdote, every bit of description is so much toward the child's education. Here, as elsewhere, the question is not how many things does he know, but how much does he know about each thing? Maps. Maps must be carefully used in this kind of work. A sketch map following the traveler's progress to be compared finally with a complete map of the region. And the teacher will exact a description of such and such a town and such and such a district marked on the map by way of testing and confirming the child's exact knowledge. In this way too, he gets intelligent notions of physical geography. In the course of his readings, he falls in with a description of a volcano, a glacier, a cannon, a hurricane. He hears about and asks and learns the how and the why of such phenomena at the moment when his interest is excited. In other words, he learns as his elders elect to learn for themselves, though they rarely allow the children to tread in paths so pleasant. What general knowledge a child of nine should have? Supposing that between the child's sixth and his ninth year, half a dozen well-chosen standard books of travel have been read with him in this way. He has gained distinct ideas of the contours, the productions and the manners of the people of every great region of the world, 
has laid up a store of reliable, valuable knowledge that will last his lifetime, and besides has done something to acquire a taste for books and the habit of reading. Such books as Lady Brassey's Voyage in the Sunbeam should be avo avoided as covering too much ground and likely to breed some confusion of ideas. Particular knowledge. But we are considering lessons as instruments of education and the sort of knowledge of the world I have indicated will be conveyed rather by readings in the children's hour and at other times than by way of lessons. I know of nothing so good as the old fashioned world at home for lessons for children between six and seven. As they hear, they wonder, admire, imagine, and can even play at a hundred situations. The first ideas of geography, the lessons on place, which should make a child observant of local geography, of the features of his own neighborhood, its heights and hollows and level lands, its streams and ponds should be gained, as we have seen out of doors, and should prepare him for a certain amount of generalization. That is, he should be able to discover definitions of river, island, lake, and so on, and should make these for himself in a tray of sand or draw them on the blackboard. Definitions. But definitions should come in the way of recording his experiences. Before he is taught what a river is, he must have watched a stream and observed that it flows and so on with the rest. Children easily simulate knowledge, and at this point the teacher will have to be careful that nothing which the child receives is mere verbiage, but that every generalization is worked out somewhat in this way. The child observes a fact as, for example, a wide stretch of flat ground. The teacher amplifies. He reads his book about Pampas, the flat countries of the northwest of Europe, the Holland of our own east coast, and by degrees he is prepared to receive the idea of a plane and to show it on his tray of sand. Fundamental ideas. By the time he is seven, or before, he finds himself in need of further knowledge. He has read of hot countries and cold countries, has observed the seasons and the rising and setting of the sun, has said to himself, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, knows something of ocean and sea, has watched the tide come in and go out, has seen many rough sketch maps made and has made some for himself and has no doubt noticed the crisscross lines on a proper map. That is to say, his mind is prepared for knowledge in various directions. There are a number of things concerned with geography which he really wants to know. The shape and motions of the earth are fundamental ideas, however difficult to grasp, but the difficulty is of a kind which increases with years. The principle in each case is simple enough, and a child does not concern himself, as do his elders, with the enormous magnitude of the scale upon which operations in space are carried on. It is probable that a child's vivid imagination puts him on a level with the math mathematician in dealing with the planetary system, with the behaviour and character of Earth, with the causes of the seasons and much besides. Meaning of a map. Then again, Geography should be learned chiefly from maps. Pictorial readings and talks introduce him to the subject. But so soon as his geography lessons become definite, they are to be learned. In the first place, from a map. This is an important principle to bear in mind. The child who gets no ideas from considering the map, say of Italy or of Russia, has no knowledge of geography however many facts about places he may be able to produce. Therefore, he should begin his study by learning the meaning of a map and how to use it. He must learn to draw a plan of his schoolroom, etc., according to scale, 
go on to the plan of a field. Consider how to make the plan of his town and be carried gradually from the idea of a plan to that of a map, always beginning with the notion of an explorer who finds the land and measures it and by means of sun and stars is able to record just where it is on the Earth's surface, east or west, north or south. Now he will arrive at the meaning of the lines of latitude and longitude. He will learn how sea and land are shown on a map, how rivers and mountains are represented. And having learned his points of direction and the use of his compass, and knowing that maps are always made, as if the beholder were looking to the north, he will be able to tell a good deal about situation, direction and the like in very early days. The fundamental ideas of geography and the meaning of a map are subjects well fitted to form an attractive introduction to the study. Some of them should awaken the delightful interest which attaches in a child's mind to that which is wonderful, incomprehensible, while the map lessons should lead to mechanical efforts equally delightful. It is only when presented to a child for the first time in the form of stale knowledge and foregone conclusions that the facts taught in such lessons appear dry and repulsive to him. An effort should be made to treat the subject with the sort of sympathetic interest and freshness which attracts children to a new study. 18. History A storehouse of ideas Much that has been said about the teaching of geography applies equally to that of history. Here too is a subject which should be to the child an inexhaustible storehouse of ideas, should enrich the chambers of his house beautiful, with a thousand tableau pathetic and heroic, and should form in him insensibly principles whereby he will hereafter judge of the behaviour of nations, and will rule his own conduct as one of a nation. This is what the study of history should do for the child. But what is he to get out of the miserable little chronicle of feuds, battles and death, which is presented to him by way of a reign, all the more repellent because it bristles with dates? As for the dates, they never come right. The tens and units he can get, but the centuries will go astray. And how is he to put the right events in the right reign? when, to him, one king differs from another only in number, one period from another only in date. But he blunders through with it, reads in his pleasant, chatty little history book all the reigns of all the kings, from William the Conqueror to William the Fourth, and back to the dim days of British rule. And what will result? This, that possibly no way of warping the judgment of the child of filling him with crude notions, narrow prejudices, is more successful than that of carrying him through some such course of English history, and all the more so if his little textbook be moral or religious in tone, and undertake to point the moral as well as to record the fact. Moral teaching falls, no doubt, within the province of history, but the one small volume which the child uses affords no scope for the fair and reasonable discussion upon which moral decisions should be based. Nor is the child old enough to be put into the judicial attitude which such a decision supposes. Outlines mischievous. The fatal mistake is in the notion that he must learn outlines or a baby edition of the whole history of England or of Rome just as he must cover the geography of all the world. Let him, on the contrary, linger pleasantly over the history of a single man, a short period, until he thinks the thoughts of that man is at home in the ways of that period. Though he is reading and thinking of a lifetime of a single man, he is really getting intimately acquainted with the history of a whole nation for a whole age. Let him spend a year of happy intimacy with Alfred, 
the truth teller, with the conqueror, with Richard and Saladin, or with Henry V, Shakespeare's Henry V, and his victorious army. Let him know the great people and the common people, the ways of the court and of the crowd. Let him know what other nations were doing while we were at home doing thus and thus. If he comes to think that the people of another age were truer, larger hearted, simpler minded than ourselves, that the people of some other land were at one time at any rate better than we, why so much the better for him. So are most history books written for children. For the matter of this intelligent teaching of history, askew in the first place nearly all history books written expressly for children. And in the next place, all compendiums, outlines, abstracts whatsoever. For the abstracts considering what part the study of history is fitted to play in the education of a child, there is not a word to be said in their favour. And as for what are called children's books, the children of educated parents are able to understand history written with literary power and are not attracted by the twaddle of reading made easy little history books. Given judicious skipping and a good deal of free paraphrasing mothers are so ready at, and the children may be taken through the first few volumes of a well-written illustrated popular history of England, say as far as the Tudors. In the course of such reading, a good deal of questioning into them and questioning out of them will be necessary both to secure their attention and to fix the facts. This is the least that should be done, but better than this would be the fuller information, more graphic details about two or three early epochs. Early history of a nation best fitted for children. The early history of a nation is far better fitted than its later records for the study of children because the story moves on a few broad simple lines, while statesmanship, so far as it exists, is no more than the efforts of a resourceful mind to cope with circumstances. Mr Freeman has provided interesting early English history for children, but is it not on the whole better to take them straight to the fountainhead where possible? In these early years, while there are no examinations ahead, and the children may yet go leisurely, let them get the spirit of history into them by reading at least one old chronicle written by a man who saw and knew something of what he wrote about and did not get it at second hand. These old books are easier and pleasanter reading than most modern works on history because the writers know little of the dignity of history. They purl along pleasantly as the forest brook tell you about it all, stir your heart with the story of a great event, amuse you with pageants and shows, make you intimate with great people and friendly with the lowly. They are just the right thing for the children whose eager souls want to get at the living people behind the words of the history book, caring nothing at all about progress or statutes or about anything but the persons for which action history is, to the child's mind, no more than a convenient stage. A child who has been carried through a single old chronicler in this way has a better foundation for an historical training than if he knew all the dates and names and facts that ever were crammed for examination. Some old chronicles. First in order of time, and full of the most captivating reading is Ecclesiastical History of England, of the Venerable Bede, who, writing of himself so early as the 7th century, says, It was always sweet to me to learn, to teach, and to write. He has left us, says Professor Morley, a history of the early years of England, succinct, yet often warm with life, businesslike, and yet childish in its tone, at once practical and spiritual, simply just, and the work of a true scholar, breathing love to God and man. We owe to Bede 
alone the knowledge of much that is most interesting in our early history. William of Malmesbury, 12th century, says of Bede, that almost all knowledge of past events was buried in the same grave with him. And he is no bad judge, for in his Chronicles of the Kings of England, he himself is considered to have carried to perfection the art of chronicle making. He is especially vivid and graphic about contemporary events, the story of the dreary civil war of Stephen and Matilda. Meantime, there is Asser, who writes of the life of Alfred, whose friend and fellow worker he is. It seems to me right, he says, to explain a little more fully what I have heard from my Lord Alfred. He tells us how, when I had come into his presence at the royal ville called Leonardford, I was honourably received by him and remained that time with him at his court about eight months, during which I read to him whatever books he liked, as such as he had at hand. For this is his most usual custom, both night and day, amid his many other occupations of mind and body, either himself to read books or to listen while others read them. When he was not present to see for himself, as at the Battle of Ashdown, Asser takes pains to get the testimony of eyewitnesses. But Alfred, as we have been told by those who were present and would not tell an untruth, marched up promptly with his men to give them battle. For King Ethelred remained a long time in his tent in prayer. Then there are Chronicles of the Crusades, contemporary narratives of the Crusades of Richard Cure de Leon by Richard de Vizes and Geoffrey de Vincenny and of the Crusade of St. Louis by Lord John de Joinville. It is needless to extend the list. One such old chronicle in a year or the suitable bits of one such chronicle and the child's imagination is aglow. His mind is teeming with ideas. He has had speech of, with those who have themselves seen and heard. And the matter of fact way in which the old monks tell their tales is exactly what children prefer. Afterwards, you may put any dull outlines into their hands and they will make history for themselves. Age of Myths but every nation has its heroic age before authentic history begins. There were giants in the land in those days, and the child wants to know about them. He has every right to revel in such classic myths as we possess as a nation, and to land him in a company of painted savages by way of giving him his first introduction to his people is a little hard. It is to make his vision of the past harsh and bald as a Chinese painting. But what is to be done? If we ever had a Homeric age, have we not, being a practical people, lost all record thereof? Here is another debt that we owe to those old monkish chroniclers. The echoes of some dim, rich past had come down to, at any rate, the 12th century. They fell upon the ear of a Welsh priest, one Geoffrey of Monmouth. And while William of Malmesbury was writing his admirable history of the kings of England, what does Geoffrey do but weave the traditions of the people into an orderly history of the British kings, reaching back all the way to King Brute, the grandson of Aeneas. How he came to know about kings that no other historian had heard of is a matter he is a little roguish about. He got it all, he says, out of that book in the British language which Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, brought out of Brittany. Be that as it may, here we read of Gorboduc, King Lear, Merlin, Uther Pendragon, and best of all, of King Arthur. The writer making the little finger of his Arthur stouter than the back of Alexander the Great. Here is indeed a treasure trove which the children should be made free of ten years before they come to read the ideals of the kings. Some caution must, however, be exercised in reading Geoffrey of Monmouth. 
His tales of Marvel are delightful, but when he quits the marvellous and romances freely about historical facts and personages, he becomes a bewildering guide. Many of these chronicles, written in Latin by the monks, are to be had in readable English. The only caution to be observed is that the mother should run her eye over the pages before she reads them aloud. Foissart, again, most delightful of chroniclers, himself tame about the court of Queen Philippa, when he chose to be in England. From whom else should the child get the story of the French wars? and so of as much else as there is time for. The principle being that wherever practicable, the child should get his first notions of a given period, not from the modern historian, the commentator and reviewer, but the original sources of history, the writings of contemporaries. The mother must, however, exercise discrimination in her choice of early chronicles as all are not equally reliable. Plutarch's Lives In the same way, readings from Plutarch's Lives will afford the best preparation for the study of Grecian or of Roman history. Alexander the Great is something more than a name to the child who reads this sort of thing. When the horse Bucephalus was offered in sale to Philip at the price of 13 talents, equals 2,518 pounds, 15 shillings, the king, with the prince and many others, went into the field to see some trial made of him. The horse appeared very vicious and unmanageable and was so far from suffering himself to be mounted that he would not bear to be spoken of, but turned fiercely upon all the grooms. Philip was displeased at their bringing him so wild and ungovernable a horse and bade them take him away. But Alexander, who had observed him well, said, what a horse they are losing for want of skill and spirit to manage him. Philip at first took no notice of this, but upon the prince's often repeating the same expression and showing great uneasiness, he said, young man, you find fault with your elders as if you knew more than they or could manage the horse better. And I certainly could, answered the prince. If you should not be able to ride him, what forfeiture will you submit for your rashness? I will pay the price of the horse. Upon this, all the company laughed, but the king and the prince agreed as to the forfeiture. Alexander ran to the horse and laying hold on the bridle, turned him to the sun. For he had observed, it seems, that the shadow which fell before the horse and continually moved as he moved greatly disturbed him. While his fierceness and fury lasted, he kept speaking to him softly and stroking him, after which he gently let fall his mantle, leapt lightly upon his back and got his seat very safe. Then, without pulling the reins too hard or using either whip or spur, he set him a-going. As soon as he perceived his uneasiness abated and that he wanted only to run, he put him in a full gallop and pushed him on both with the voice and spur. Philip and all his court were in great distress for him at first and a profound silence took place. But when the prince had turned him and brought him safe back, they all received him with loud exclamations, except his father, who wept for joy and kissing him, said, Seek another kingdom, my son, that may be worthy of thy abilities, for Macedonia is too small for thee. Here again, in North's inimitable translation, we get the sort of vivid graphic presentation which makes history as real to the child as are the adventures of Robinson Crusoe. To sum up, to know as much as may be about even one short period is far better for the children than to know the outlines of all history. And in the second place, children are quite able to take in intelligent ideas in intelligent language 
and should by no means be excluded from the best that is written on the period they are about. History books. It is not at all easy to choose the right history books for children. Mere summaries of facts must, as we have seen, be eschewed, and we must be equally careful to avoid generalizations. The natural function of the mind in the early years of life is to gather the material of knowledge with a view to that very labor of generalization which is proper to the adult mind a labour which we should all carry on to some extent for ourselves. As it is, our minds are so poorly furnished that we accept the conclusions presented to us without demure. But we can, at any rate, avoid giving children cut and dried opinions upon the course of history while they are yet young. What they want is graphic details concerning events and persons upon which imagination goes to work, and opinions tend to form themselves by slow degrees as knowledge grows. Mr. York Powell has, perhaps, more than any other, hit upon the right teaching for young children I have in view. In the preface of his old stories from British history, he says, the writer has chosen such stories as he thought would amuse and please his readers and give them at the same time some knowledge of the lives and thoughts of their forefathers. To this end, he has not written solely of great folk, kings and queens and generals, but also of plain people and children, ay, the birds and beasts too. And we get the tale of King Lear and of Cuculan and of King Canute and the poet Otter, of Havelock and Uber and many more, all brave and glorious stories. Indeed, Mr. York Powell gives us a perfect treasure trove in his two volumes of old stories and sketches from British history, which are better for our purpose because children can read them for themselves so soon as they are able to read it all. These tales, written in good, simple English, and with a certain charm of style, lend themselves admirably to narration. Indeed, it is most interesting to hear children of seven and eight go through a very long story without missing a detail, putting every event in its right order. These narrations are never a slavish reproduction of the original. A child's individuality plays about what he enjoys, and the story comes from his lips not precisely as the author tells it, but with a certain spirit and colouring which express the narrator. By the way, it is very important that children should be allowed to narrate in their own way and should not be pulled up or helped with words and expressions from the text. A narration should be original as it comes from a child, that is, his own mind should have acted upon the matter it has received. Narratives which are mere feats of memory are quite valueless. I have already spoken of the sorts of old chronicles upon which children should be nourished, but these are often too diffuse to offer good matter for narration, and it is well to have quite fitting short tales for this purpose. I should like to mention two other little volumes in which children delight, which feed patriotic sentiment and lay a broad basis for historical knowledge. I mean Mrs. Fruin Lord's Tales from St. Paul's and Tales from Westminster Abbey. It is a beautiful and delightful thing to take children informed by these tales to the Abbey or St. Paul's and let them identify themselves for themselves the spots consecrated to their heroes. They know so much and are so full of vivid interest that their elders stand by instructed and inspired. There are no doubt multitudes of historical tales and sketches for children, and some of them, like Miss Brooks Hunt's Prisoners of the Tower, are very good. But let the mother beware. There is nothing which calls for more delicate tact and understanding sympathy with the children than this apparently similar, simple matter of choosing their lesson books 
and especially perhaps their lesson books in history. Many children of eight or nine will be quite ready to read with pleasure A History of England by H.O. Arnold Forster, who has long since won his spurs in the field of educational literature. In this, as in matters of more immediate statecraft, Mr. Arnold Forster has the gift to see a defect and a remedy, an omission and the means of supplying it. He saw that English children grew up without any knowledge of the conditions under which they live and of the laws which govern them. But since the appearance of the citizen reader and the laws of everyday life, we have changed all that. The history of England, or as the children call it, history, ignoring the fact that there is any other history than that of England, has hitherto been presented to the young people as outlines of dates and facts, or as collections of romantic stories with little coherence and less result in the fortunes of the country. Mr. Arnold Forster says in his preface that he is reluctant to introduce his book by any such repellent title as a summary or an outline of English history. Such titles seem on the face of them to imply that the element of interest and the romance inseparable from the life and doings of individuals are excluded and that an amplified chronological table has been made to do duty for history. But to read English history and fail to realise that it is replete with interest, sparkling with episode and full of dramatic incident is to miss all the pleasure and most of the instruction which its study, if properly pursued, can give. The author fulfils his implied promise And his work is, I venture to say, as replete with interest, sparkling with episode and full of dramatic incident as it is possible, considering the limitations imposed upon him by the facts that he writes for uneducated readers and gives us a survey of the whole of English history in a pleasant, copiously and wisely illustrated volume of some 800 pages. How telling and lucid this is. For example, and how we all wish we had come across such a paragraph in our early studies of architecture. On page 23, we have pictures of two windows. One of them is what we call a pointed window. All the arches in it go up to a point. It was built a long time before the Tudor period. The other was built in the time of Queen Elizabeth. In it, the upright shaft or mullion of the window goes straight up to the top without forming an arch. This style of building a window is called a perpendicular style because the mullions of the windows are perpendicular. Some of the most famous buildings in England built in the Tudor times and in the perpendicular style are the Chapel of King's College, Cambridge and Hatfield House the residence of the Marquess of Salisbury in Hertfordshire. Mr. Arnold Forster has done in this volume for children and the illiterate what Professor Green did in his Shorter History of England for somewhat more advanced students, awakening many to the fact that history is an entrancing subject of study. This is a real introduction to real history. The portraits are an especially valuable feature of the work. Dates. In order to give definiteness to what may soon become a pretty wide knowledge of history, mount a sheet of cartridge paper and divide it into 20 columns, letting the first century of the Christian era come into the middle and let each remaining column represent a century BC or AD as the case may be. Then let the child himself write or print as he is able the names of the people he comes upon in due order in their proper century. We need not trouble ourselves at present with more exact dates, but this simple table of the centuries will suggest a graphic panorama to the child's mind and he will see events in their time order. Illustrations by the children. 
History readings afford admirable material for narration and children enjoy narrating what they have read or heard. They love too to make illustrations. Children who had been reading Julius Caesar and also Plutarch's life were asked to make a picture of their favourite scene and the results show the extraordinary power of visualising what the little people possess. Of course, that which they visualise or imagine clearly, they know it is a life possession. The drawings of the children in question are psychologically interesting as showing what various and sometimes obscure points appeal to the mind of a child. And also, that children have the same intellectual pleasure as persons of cultivated mind in working out new hints and suggestions. The drawings, be it said, leave much to be desired, but they have this in common with the art of primitive peoples. They tell the tale directly and vividly. A girl of nine and a half pictures Julius Caesar conquering Britain. He rides in a chariot mounted on scythes. He is robed in blue and bits of blue sky here and there give the complementary colour. In the distance, a soldier plants the ensign bearing the Roman eagle, black on a pink background. In the foreground is a hand-to-hand -hand combat between Roman and Britain, each having a sword of enormous length. Other figures are variously employed. Another gives us Antony, making his speech after the death of Caesar. This girl, who is older, gives us architecture. You look through an arch which leads into a side street and in the foreground, Antony stands on a platform at the head of a flight of marble steps. Antony's attitude expresses indignation and scorn. Below is a crowd of Romans wearing the toga whose attitudes show various shades of consternation and dismay. Behind is Antony's servant in uniform holding his master's horse and on the platform, in the rear of Antony, lies Caesar, with the royal purple thrown over him. The chief value of the drawing, as a drawing, is that it tells a tale. Another girl draws Calpurnia, begging Caesar not to go to the Senate. Caesar stands armed and perturbed, while Calpurnia holds his outstretched hand with both of hers, as she kneels before him her face raised in entreaty. Her loose blue night robe and long golden hair give colour to the picture. This artist is 14 and the drawing is better done. Another artist presents Brutus and Portia in an orchard with a south wall of red brick, espaliers and two dignified figures which hardly tell their tale. Another child gives us the scene in a forum, Caesar seated in royal purple, Brutus kneeling before him, and Casca standing behind his chair with outstretched hand holding a dagger saying, speak hands for me, while Caesar says, doth not Brutus bootless kneel? Again, we get Lucius playing to Brutus in the tent. Brutus armed cap a pie seated on a stool is vainly trying to read while, Lu while Lucius, a pretty figure, seated before him plays the harp. The two centuries, also fully armed, are stretched on the floor sound asleep. Another gives us Claudius dressed as a woman at the women's festival, the ladies with remarkable eyes and each carrying a flaming torch. Another pictures with great spirit Caesar reading his history to the conquered Gauls who stand in rows on the hillside listening to the great man with exemplary patience. In these original illustrations, several of them by older children than those we have in view here, we get an example of the various images that present themselves to the minds of children during the reading of the great work and a single such glimpse into a child's mind convinces us of the importance of sustaining that mind upon strong meat. Imagination does not stir at the suggestion of the feeble, much diluted stuff that is only too often put into children's hands. 
playing at history. Children have other ways of expressing the conceptions that fill them when they are duly fed. They play at their history lessons, dress up, make tableau, act scenes, and they have a stage and their dolls act while they paint the scenery and speak the speeches. There is no end to the modes of expression children find when there is anything in them to express. The mistake we make is to suppose that imagination is fed by nature or that it works on the insipid diet of the children's storybooks. Let a child have the meat he requires in his history readings and in the literature which naturally gathers round this history and imagination will bestir itself without any help of ours. The child will live out in detail a thousand scenes of which he only gets the merest hint. 19. Grammar Grammar a difficult study. Of grammar, Latin and English, I shall say very little here. In the first place, grammar, being a study of words and not of things, is by no means attractive to the child, nor should he be hurried into it. English grammar, again, depending as it does on the position and logical connection of words, is peculiarly hard for him to grasp. In this respect, the Latin grammar is easier. A change in the form, the shape of the word, to denote case, is what a child can see with his bodily eye and therefore is plainer to him than the abstract ideas of nominative and objective case as we have them in English. Therefore, if he learns no more at this early stage than the declensions and a verb or two, it is well he should learn thus much, if only to help him see what English grammar would be at when it speaks of a change in case or mood, yet shows no change in the form of the word. Latin grammar. Of the teaching of Latin grammar, I think I cannot do better than mention a book for beginners that really answers. Children of eight or nine take to this first Latin course, Scott and Jones, very kindly. And it is a great thing to begin a study with pleasure. It is an open question, however, whether it is desirable to begin Latin at so early an age. English grammar, a logical study. Because English grammar is a logical study and deals with sentences and the positions that words occupy in them rather than with words and what they are in their own right, it is better that the child should begin with a sentence and not with the parts of speech. That is, that he should learn a little of what is called analysis of sentences before he learns to pass should learn to divide simple sentences into the thing we speak of and what we say about it. The cat sits on the hearth before he is lost in the log of person, mood and part of speech. So then I took up the next book. It was about grammar. It said extraordinary things about nouns and verbs and particles and pronouns and past participles and objective cases and subjunctive moods. What are all these things? asked the king. I don't know, your majesty, and the queen did not know, but she said it would be very suitable for children to learn. It would keep them quiet. It is so important that children should not be puzzled, as were this bewildered king and queen, that I add a couple of introductory grammar lessons. As a single example, it is often more useful than many precepts. Lesson 1. Words put together so as to make sense from what is called a sentence. Barley, oats, chair, really good and cherry is not a sentence because it makes no non-sense. Tom has said his lesson is a sentence. It is a sentence because it tells us something about Tom. Every sentence speaks of someone or of something and tells us something about that of which it speaks. So a sentence has two parts. 
One, the thing we speak of. Two, what we say about it. In our sentence, we speak of Tom. We say about him that he has learned his lesson. The thing we speak of is often called the subject, which just means that which we talk about. People sometimes say the subject of a conversation was so and so, which is another way of saying the thing we were speaking about was so and so. To be learnt. Words put together so as to make sense form a sentence. A sentence has two parts, that which we speak of and what we say about it. That which we speak of is the subject. Exercises on lesson one. One, put the first part to blank. Blank has a long mane. Blank is broken. Blank cannot do his sums. Blank played for an hour, etc., etc. Two, put the second part to blank. That poor boy blank. My brother Tom blank. The broken flower pot blank. Bread and jam blank. Brown's tool basket blank, etc., etc. Three, put six different subjects to each half sentence in one. Four, make six different sentences with each subject in two. Five, say which part of the sentence is wanting and supply it in blank. Has been mended, Tom's knife, that little dog, cut his finger, ate too much fruit, my new book, the snowdrops in our garden, etc., etc. NB, be careful to call the first part of each sentence the subject. Draw a line under the subject of each sentence in all exercises. Lesson two, we may make a sentence with only two words, the name of the thing we speak of and what we say about it. John writes, birds sing, Mary sews. We speak about John. We say about him that he writes. We speak about birds. We say about them that they sing. These words, writes, sing, sows, all come out of the same group of words. And the words in that group are the chief words of all. For this reason, we cannot make sense and therefore cannot make a sentence without using at least one of them. They are called verbs, which mean words because they are the chief words of all. A verb always tells one of two things about the subject. Either it tells what the subject is, as I am hungry, the chair is broken, the birds are merry, or it tells what the subject does, as Alice writes, the cat mews, he calls. To be learnt, we cannot make the sentence without a verb. Verb means word. Verbs are the chief words. Verbs show that the subject is something. He is sleepy or does something. He runs. Exercise in lesson two. One, put in a verb of being. Mary blank sleepy. Boys blank rough. Girls blank blank quiet. He blank first yesterday. I blank a little boy. Tom and George blank swinging before dinner. We blank blank busy tomorrow. He blank blank punished, etc. etc. Two, make three sentences with each of the following verbs is, are, should be, was, am, were, shall be, will be. Three, make six sentences with verbs of being in each. Four, put a verb of doing to tigers blank, the boy with the pony blank my cousins blank, etc, etc. Five, make 20 sentences about that boy in kilts with verbs showing what he does. Six, find the verbs and say whether of being or doing. In the bright sun rises over the hill. We went away. You are my cousin. George goes to school. He took his slate. We are seven. Seven, count how many verbs you use in your talk for the next 10 minutes. Eight, 
Write every verb you can find in these exercises and draw a line under it. 20. French. French should be acquired as English is, not as a grammar, but as a living speech. To train the ear to distinguish and the lips to produce the French vocables is a valuable part of the education of the senses and one which can hardly be undertaken too soon. Again, all educated persons should be able to speak French. Sir Lion Playfair, once speaking at a conference of French masters, lamented feeling our degeneracy in this respect and instanced the grammar school of Perth to show that in a Scotch school in the 16th century, the boys were required to speak Latin during school hours and French at all other times. There is hardly another civilized nation so dull in acquiring foreign tongues as we English of the present time. But probably the fault lies rather in the way we set about the study than in any natural incapacity for languages. As regards French, for instance, our difficulties are twofold. The want of a vocabulary and a certain awkwardness in producing unfamiliar sounds. It is evident that both these hindrances should be removed in early childhood. The child should never see French words in print until he has learned to say them with as much ease and readiness as if they were English. The desire to give printed combinations of letters the sounds they would bear in English words is the real cause of our national difficulty in pronouncing French. Again, the child's vocabulary should increase steadily, say, at the rate of half a dozen words a day. Think of 1,500 words in a year. The child who has that number of words and knows how to apply them can speak French. Of course, his teacher will take care that, in giving words, she gives idioms also, and that as he learns new words, they are put into sentences and kept in use from day to day. A notebook in which she enters the child's new words and sentences will easily enable the teacher to do this. The young child has no foolish shame about saying French words. He pronounces them as simply as if they were English. But it is very important that he should acquire a pure accent from the first. It is not often advisable that young English children should be put into the hands of a French governess or nurse. But would it not be possible for half a dozen families, say, to engage a French lady who would give half an hour daily to each family? M. Gouin's Method A serious effort is being made to approach the study of foreign languages rationally and scientifically. I have no hesitation in saying that Monsieur Gouin's work, The Art of Teaching and Studying Languages, is the most important attempt that has yet been made to bring the study of languages within the sphere of practical education. Indeed, the great reform in our methods of teaching modern languages owe their origin to this remarkable work. The initial idea that we must acquire a new language as a child acquires his mother tongue is absolutely right. Whether the attempt to follow this idea out by analysing a language in certain number, say 15, exhaustive series be right or not. Again, it is incontestable that the ear and not the eye is the physical organ for apprehending a language just as truly as it is by the mouth and not the ear we appropriate food. If Monsieur Gouin's book establish these two points only, it will be a valuable contribution to educational thought. Equally important is his third position that the verb is the key to the sentence and more is the living bridge between thought and act. He maintains too that the child thinks in sentences, not in words. That his sentences have a logical sequence. That this sequence is one of time. The order of the operations in, for example, the growth of a plant or the grinding of corn in a mill. 
that as the child perceives the operations, he has an absolute need to express them, that his ear solicits, his memory cherishes, his tongue reproduces the words which say the thing he thinks. No doubt Monsieur Gouin's method should be more successful than any other in steeping the student, child or man, in German or French thought. If you are all day long trying to work out a series in French, say you come to think in French, to dream in French, to speak French. Moreover, if one has a delightful sense that at last the way is made clear to us to conduct all teaching in the language under study. You have the art series and the B series and the river and the character series and the poet series and any series you like. You think the thing out in order of time and natural sequence. You get the right verbs, nouns and such epithets as are necessary, follow suit and in amazingly few sentences, very short sentences too, connected by and, you have said all that is essential to the subject. The whole thing is a constant surprise, like the children's game which unearths the most extraordinary and out of the way thing you can think of by means of a dozen or so questions. The series. Thus a language learned by Monsieur Gouin's method is a liberal education in itself. One learns how few and simple are, after all, the conceptions of which the human mind is cognizant and how few and simple, putting mere verbiage aside, are the words necessary to express these. You really learn to think in the new language because you have no more than vague impressions about these acts or facts in your mother tongue. You order your thoughts in the new language and having done so, the words which express these are an inalienable possession. Here is an example of an elementary series showing how the servant lights the fire. The servant takes a box of matches, takes. She opens the match box, opens. She takes out a match, takes out. She shuts up the match box, shuts up. She strikes the match on the cover, strikes. The match takes fire, takes fire. The match smokes, smokes. The match flames, flames. The match burns, burns. And spreads a smell of burning over the kitchen, spreads. The servant bends down to the hearth, bends down. Puts out her hand, puts out. Puts the match under the shavings, puts holds the match under the shavings, holds. The shavings take fire, take fire. The servant leaves go of the match, leaves go, stands up again, stands up, looks at her fire burning, looks, and puts back the box of matches in its place, puts back. But any attempt to quote gives an uncertain and unsatisfactory idea of this important work. How does the child learn? Whatever may be said of Mr. Gouin's methods, the steps by which he arrives at them are undoubtedly scientific. He learns from a child. Unhappily, the child has remained up to the present a hackneyed riddle, which we have never taken sufficient trouble to decipher or examine. The little child, which at age of two years utters nothing but meaningless exclamations, at the age of three finds itself in possession of a complete language. How does it accomplish this? Does this miracle admit of explanation or not? Is it a problem of which there is a possibility of finding the unknown quantity? The organ of language, ask the little child, is not the eye, it is the ear. The eye is made for colors and not for sounds and words. This tension, continuous and contrary to nature, of the organ of sound, the forced precipitancy of visual act, produces what it was bound to produce, a disease of the eyesight. This refers to Monsieur Gouin's Herculean labours in the attempt to learn German. He knew everybody's method, learned the whole dictionary through, and found at the end that he did not know one word of German as she is spoke. He returned to France, 
after a 10 months absence and found that his little nephew, whom he had left a child of two and a half, not yet able to talk, had in the interval done what his uncle had signally failed to do. What, I thought, this child and I have been working for the same time, each at a language. He playing around his mother, running after flowers, butterflies and birds without weariness, without apparent effort, without even being conscious of his work, is able to say all he thinks, express all he sees, understand all he hears. And when he began his work, his intelligence was yet a futurity, a glimmer, a hope. And I, versed in the sciences, versed in philosophy, armed with a powerful will, gifted with a powerful memory, have arrived at nothing, or practically nothing. The linguistic science of the college has deceived me, has misguided me. The classic method with its grammar, its dictionary, and its translations is a delusion. To surprise nature's secret, I must watch this child. Monsieur Gouin watches the child. The work in question is the result of his observations. The method of teaching may be varied, partly because that recommended by Monsieur Gouin requires a perfect command of the French tongue, and teachers who are diffident find a conversational method founded on a book and picture easier to work and perhaps as effectual, more so some people think. But be this as it may, it is to Monsieur Gouin we owe the fundamental idea. It is satisfactory to find principles which we have urged continually, enunciated in this most thoughtful work. For example, if one learns French without being able to read it, as the child does, there will be no longer much greater difficulty in pronouncing it than in pronouncing words in English. How about spelling, you will ask. The spelling, you will learn it as the young French children learn it, as you yourself have learned English spelling, 10 times more difficult than the French. And this without letting the study of spelling spoil you your already acquired pronunciation. Besides, the spelling is a thing that can be reformed, the pronunciation hardly at all. We must choose between the two evils. Monsieur Gouin speaks of the possibility of a child's picking up another tongue, even Chinese from a Chinese nurse. And his words remind me of an extraordinary instance of a child's faculty in picking up languages, which once came before me. Having occasion to speak in public of three little children, all aged three, belonging to different families, where one parent was English, the other German, I said that these three children of my acquaintance could each say everything they had to say, express the whole range of their, their ideas with equal ease and fluency in the two languages. At the close of the meeting, a gentleman present came forward and endorsed my remarks. He said he had a son whose wife was a German lady and who was now a missionary in Baghdad. They had a child of three and their child speaks three languages with perfect fluency, English, German and Arabic. No doubt the child will forget two of the three and this is no argument for teaching foreign tongues to babies. But surely it does prove that the acquisition of a foreign tongue need not present insuperable difficulties to any of us. 21 Pictorial Art Study of Pictures The art training of children should proceed on two lines. The six-year-old child should begin both to express himself and to appreciate, and his appreciation should be well in advance of his power to express what he sees or imagines. Therefore, it is a lamentable thing when the appreciation of children is exercised only upon the coloured lithographs of their picture books or of the Christmas number. But the reader will say, a young child cannot appreciate art. It is only the colour and sentiment of a picture that reach him. A vividly coloured presentation of Bobby's birthday 
or of Barbara's broken doll will find its way straight into his business and bosom. Therefore, says the reader, nature indicates the sort of art proper for children. But as a matter of fact, the minds of children and of their elders alike accommodate themselves to what is put in their way. And if children appreciate the vulgar and sentimental in art, it is because that is the manner of art to which they become habituated. A little boy of about nine was, with many others, given reproductions of some half dozen of the pictures of Jean Francois Millet to study during a school term. At the end, the children were asked to describe the one of these pictures which they liked best. Of course, they did it and did it well. This is what the little boy I mentioned makes of it. I liked the sower best. The sower is sowing seeds. The picture is all dark except high up on the right hand side where there is a man ploughing in the field. While he is ploughing in the field, the sower sows. The sower has got a bag in his left hand and is sowing with his right hand. He has wooden clogs on. He is sewing at about six o'clock in the morning. You can see his head better than his legs and body because it is against the light. A little girl of seven prefers the angelus and says, the picture is about people in the fields, a man and a woman. By the woman is a basket with something in it. Behind her is a wheelbarrow. They are praying. The man has his hat off in his hand. You can tell that it is evening because the wheelbarrow and the basket are loaded. Should be regular. When children have begun regular lessons, that is, as soon as they are six, this sort of study of pictures should not be left to chance, but they should take one artist after another term by term and study quietly some half dozen reproductions of his work in the course of a term. The little memory outlines I have quoted show that something definite remains with a child after his studies. But this is the least of the gains. We cannot measure the influence that one or another artist has upon the child's sense of beauty, upon his power of seeing, as in a picture, the common sights of life. He is enriched more than we know in having really looked at even a single picture. It is a mistake to think that colour is quite necessary to children in their art studies. They find colour in many places and are content for the time with form and feeling in their pictures. By the way, for schoolroom decorations, I know of nothing better than the Fitzroy pictures, especially those of the Four Seasons, where you get beauty, both of line and colour, and poetic feeling. I should like too, to quote Ruskin's counsel that English children should be brought up on Jean Richter's picture books for children. The Unservator, Sontag and the rest. I subjoin notes of a lesson on a picture talk given to children of eight and nine to show how this sort of lesson may be given. Picture talk. Objects. One. To continue the series of Landseer's pictures the children are taking in school. Two, to increase their interest in Landseer's works. Three, to show the importance of his acquaintance with animals. Four, to help them read a picture truly. Five, to increase their powers of attention and observation. Step one. Ask the children if they remember what their last picture talk was about and what artist was famous for animal painting. Tell them Landseer was acquainted with animals when he was quite young. He had dogs for pets and because he loved them, he studied them and their habits, so was able to paint them. Step two, give them the picture Alexander and Diogenes to look at and ask them to find out all they can see about it themselves and to think what idea the artist had in his mind and what idea or ideas he meant his picture to convey to us. 
Step three, after three or four minutes, take the picture away and see what the children have noticed. Then ask them what the different dogs suggest to them. The strength of the Mastiff represents Alexander, the dignity and stateliness of the bloodhounds in his rear, the look of the wise counsellor on the face of the setter, the rather contemptuous look of the rough-haired terrier in the tub. Ask the children if they have noticed anything in the picture which shows the time of day. For example, the tools thrown down by the side of the workman's basket suggesting the midday meal and the bright sunshine on the dogs who cast a shadow on the tub shows it must be somewhere about noon. Step four, let them read the title and tell any facts they know about Alexander and Diogenes. Then tell them that Alexander was a great conqueror who lived BC 356 to 323, famous for the battles he won against Persia, India, and along the coast of the Mediterranean. He was very proud, strong, and boastful. Diogenes was a cynic philosopher. Explain cynic, illustrating by the legend of Alexander and Diogenes. And from it, find out which dog represents Alexander and which Diogenes. Step five, let the children draw the chief lines of the picture in five minutes with pencil and paper. Original illustrations. I have spoken from time to time of original illustrations drawn by the children. It may be of use to subjoin notes of a lesson, showing the sort of occasional help a teacher may give in this kind of work. But in a general way, it is best to leave children to themselves. Objects. One, to help the children to make clear mental pictures from description and to re reproduce the same in painting. Two, to increase their power of imagination. Three, to help them in their ideas of form and color. Four, to increase their interest in the story of Beowulf by letting them illustrate a scene from the book they are reading. Five, to bring out their idea of an unknown creature, Grendel. Steps. Step one, to draw from the children what they know of the poem Beowulf and of the hero himself. Step two, to tell them any points they may miss in the story as far as they have read, i.e. to the death of Grendel. Step three, to read the description of the dress at the time and the account of Grendel's death, including three possible pictures. Step four, to draw from the children what mental pictures they have made and to reread the passage. Step five, to let them produce their mental pictures with brush and paint. Step six, to show them George Harrow's original illustration of Beowulf in Heroes of Chivalry and Romance. Drawing lessons. But for their actual drawing lessons, says the reader, I suppose you use blobs. Blobs, i.e. splashes of paint, made with the flat of the brush, which take an oval form. I think blobs have one use. They give a certain freedom in using colour. Otherwise, blobs seem to me a sort of apparatus of art which a child acquires with a good deal of labour and with which by proper combinations into flowers and so on, he can produce effects beyond his legitimate power as an artist. While all the time he can do this without a particle of the feeling for the natural object which is the very soul of art. The power of effective creation by a sort of clever trick maims those delicate feelers of a child's nature by which he apprehends art. Let the eye, says Ruskin, but rest on a rough piece of branch of curious form during a conversation with a friend, rest, however unconsciously, and though the conversation be forgotten, though every circumstance connected with it be as utterly lost to the memory as though it had not been, yet the eye will, 
through the whole life after take a certain pleasure in such bows which it had not before. A pleasure so slight, a trace of feeling so delicate as to leave us utterly unconscious of its peculiar power, but undestroyable by any reasoning, a part thenceforward of our constitution. This is what we wish to do for children in teaching them to draw, to cause the eye to rest, not unconsciously, but consciously on some object of beauty, which will leave in their minds an image of delight for all their lives to come. Children of six and seven draw budding twigs of oak and ash, beech and larch, with such tender fidelity to color, tone and gesture, that the crude little drawings are in themselves things of beauty. Children have art in them. With art, as with so many other things in a child, we must believe that it is there or we shall never find it. Once again, here is a delicate Ariel, whom it is our part to deliver from his bonds. Therefore, we set twig or growing flower before a child and let him deal with it as he chooses. He will find his own way to form and color and our help may very well be limited at first to such technical matters as the mixing of colors and the like. In order that we may not impede the child's freedom or hinder the deliverance of the art that is in him, we must be careful not to offer any aids in the way of guiding lines, points, or such other crutches. And also, he should work in the easiest medium that is with paintbrush or with charcoal and not with a black lead pencil. Boxes of cheap color are to be avoided. Children are worthy of the best and some half dozen tubes of really good colors will last a long time and will satisfy the eye of the little artists. Clay modeling. While speaking of the art training of children, it may be as well to give a word to clay modeling. Neat little birds' nests, baskets of eggs, etc., are of no use in the way of art development and soon cease to be amusing. The chief thing the teacher has to do is to show the child how to prepare his clay so as to expel air bubbles and to give him the idea of making a little platform for his work so that it may, from the first, have an artistic effect. Then put before him an apple, a banana, a Brazil nut or the like. Let him not take a lump of clay or squeeze it into shape, but build up the shape he desires morsel by morsel. His own artistic perception seizes on the dint in the apple, the crease in the child's shoe, the little notes of expression in the objects which break uniformity and make for art. The piano and singing. I must close with a disappointing sense that subjects of importance in the child's education have been left out of count and that no one matter has been adequately treated. Certain subjects of peculiar educational value, music for instance, I have said nothing about, partly for want of space and partly because if the mother have not Sir Joshua Reynolds, that in her hints from an outsider will not produce the art feeling which is the condition of success in this sort of teaching. If possible, let the children learn from the first under artists, lovers of their work. It is a serious mistake to let the child lay the foundation of whatever he may do in the future under ill-qualified mechanical teachers who kindle in him none of the enthusiasm which is the life of art. I should like, in connection with singing, to mention the admirable educational effects of the tonic sol fa method. Children learn it in a magical way to produce sign for sound and sound for sign. That is, they can not only read music, but can write the notes for, or make the proper hand signs for, the notes of a passage sung to them. Ear and voice are simultaneously and equally cultivated.
Mrs. Kerwin's child pianist method is worked out with minute care upon the same lines. That is, the child's knowledge of the theory of music and his ear training keep pace with his power of execution and seem to do away with the deadly dreariness of practicing. Handicrafts and drills. It is not possible to do more than mention two more important subjects, the handicrafts and drills, which should form a regular part of the child's daily life. For physical training, nothing is so good as Ling's Swedish drill, and a few of the early exercises are within the reach of children under nine. Dancing and the various musical drills lend themselves to grace of movement and give more pleasure, if less scientific training, to the little people. The handicrafts best fitted for children under nine seems to me to be chair caning, carton work, basket work, Smyrna rugs, Japanese curtains, carving in cork, samplers on coarse canvas showing a variety of stitches, easy needlework, knitting, big needles and wool, etc. The points to be borne in mind in children's handicrafts are a that they should not be employed in making futilities such as pea and stick work, paper mats and the like. B, that they should be taught slowly and carefully what they are to do. C, that slipshod work should not be allowed. D, and that therefore the children's work should be kept well within their compass. May I hope in concluding this short review of the subjects proper for a child's intellectual education that enough has been said to show the necessity of grave consideration on the mother's part before she allow promiscuous little lesson books to be put into the hands of her children or trusts ill-qualified persons to strike out methods of teaching for themselves. Part four, the will, the conscience, the divine life in the child. One, the will. Government of man's soul. We have now to consider a subject of unspeakable importance to every being called upon to sustain a reasonable life here with the hope of a fuller life hereafter. I mean the government of the kingdom of man's soul. Every child who lives long enough in the world is invested by degrees with this high function and it is the part of his parents to instruct him in his duties and to practice him in his tasks. Now, the government of this kingdom of man's soul is like that of some well-ordered states carried on in three chambers, each chamber with its own functions exercised not by a multitude of councillors, but by a single minister. Executive power vested in the will. In the outer of the three chambers sits the will. Like that Roman centurion, he has soldiers under him. He says to this man, go, and he goeth. To another, come, and he cometh. To a third, do this, and he doeth it. In other words, the executive power is vested in the will. If the will have the habit of authority, if it deliver its mandates in the tone that constrains obedience, the kingdom is, at any rate, at unity with itself. If the will be feeble, of uncertain counsels, poor man's soul is torn with disorder and rebellion. What is the will? I do not know what the will is. It would appear to be an ultimate fact, not admitting of definition. But there are few subjects on which those who have the education of children in their hands make more injurious mistakes. And therefore it is worthwhile to consider, as we may, what are the functions of the will and what are its limitations? Persons may go through life without deliberate act of will. In the first place, the will does not necessarily come into play in any of the aspects which we have hitherto considered the child. He may reflect and imagine, be stirred by the desire of knowledge, of power, of distinction, may love and esteem, 
may form habits of attention, obedience, diligence, sloth, involuntarily, that is, without ever intending, purposing, willing these things for himself. So far is this true that there are people who live through their lives without an act of deliberate will, amiable, easygoing people, on the one hand, hedged in by favouring circumstances, and poor souls on the other, whom circumstances have not saved, who have drifted from their moorings and are hardly to be named by those to whom they belong. Great intellectual powers by no means imply a controlling will. We read how Coldridge had to be taken care of because he had so little power of willing. His thoughts were as, as little under his own volition as his actions. And the fine talk people went to hear was no more than an endless pouring forth of ideas connected by no other link than that of association. Though so fine was his mind that his ideas flowed methodically of their own accord, so to speak. Character the result of conduct regulated by will. It is not necessary to say a word about the dignity and force of character which a confirmed will gives its possessor. In fact, character is the result of conduct regulated by will. We say so and so has a great deal of character. Such another is without character. And we might express the fact equally by saying so and so has a vigorous will. Such another has no force of will. We all know of lives rich in gifts and graces, which have been wrecked for the lack of a determining will. Three functions of the will. The will is the controller of the passions and emotions, the director of desires, the ruler of the appetites. But observe the passions, the desires, the appetites are there already and the will gathers force and vigour only as it is exercised in the repression and direction of these. For though the will appears to be of purely spiritual nature, yet it behaves like any member of the body in this, that it becomes vigorous and capable in proportion as it is duly nourished and fitly employed. A limitation of the will disregarded by some novelists. The villain of a novel, it is true, is, or rather used to be, an interesting person because he was always endowed with a powerful will, which acted not in controlling his violent passions, but in aiding and abetting them. The result was a diabolical being out of the common way of nature. And no wonder, for according to natural law, the member which does not fulfill its own functions is punished by loss of power. If it does not cease to be, it becomes as though it were not. And the will, being placed in the seat of authority, is not able to carry its forces over to the mob. The disorder would be too fearful, just as when the executive powers of a state are seized upon by a riotous mob and there are shootings in the highways and hangings from the lantern. Infinite confusion everywhere. Parents fall into this metaphysical blunder. I am anxious to bring before you this limitation of the will to its own proper functions because parents often enough fall into the very metaphysical blunder we have seen in the novel writer. They admire a vigorous will and rightly they know that if their child is to make his mark on the world, it must be by force of will. What follows? The baby screams himself into fits for a forbidden plaything, and the mother says, he has such a strong will. The little fellow of three stands roaring in the street and will neither go hither nor thither with his nurse because he has such a strong will. He will rule the sports of the nursery, will monopolise his sister's playthings, all because of this strong will. Now we come to a divergence of opinion. On the one hand, the parents decide that whatever the consequence, the child's will is not to be broken. So all his vagaries must go unchecked. On the other, 
the decision is that the child's will must be broken at all hazards and the poor little being is subjected to a dreary round of punishment and repression. Willfulness indicates want of willpower. But all the time, nobody perceives that it is the mere want of will that is the matter with the child. He is in a state of absolute willfulness, the rather unfortunate word we use to describe the state in which the will has no controlling power. Willlessness, if there were such a word, would describe this state more truly. Now, this confusion in the minds of many persons between the state of willfulness is that of being dominated by will leads to mischievous results, even where willfulness is not fostered nor the child unduly repressed. It leads to the neglect of the due cultivation and training of the will, that almost divine possession upon the employment of which every other gift, be it beauty or genius, strength or skill, depends for its value. What is willfulness? What then is willfulness if it not be an exercise of will? Simply this, remove bit and bridle, that is the control of the will, from the appetites, the desires, the emotions, and the child who has mounted his hobby, be it resentment, jealousy, desire of power, desire of property, is another mazeppa, born along with the speed of the swift and the strength of the strong, and with no power at all to help himself. Appetite, passion, there is no limit to their power and their persistence if the appointed check be removed. And it is this impetus of appetite or of passion, this apparent determination to go in one way and no other, which is called willfulness and mistaken for an exercise of will. Whereas the determination is only apparent, the child is, in fact, hurried along without resistance because that opposing force which should give balance to his character is undeveloped and untrained. The will has superior and inferior functions. The will has its superior and its inferior, what may be called its moral and its mechanical functions. And that will which, for want of practice, has grown flaccid and feeble in the exercise of its higher functions may yet be able for the ordering of such matters as going or coming, sitting or standing, speaking or refraining from speech. The will not a moral faculty. Again, though it is impossible to attain moral excellence of character without the agency of a vigorous will, the will itself is not a moral faculty and a man may attain great strength of will in consequence of continued efforts in the repression or direction of his appetites or desires and yet be an unworthy man. That is, he may be keeping himself in order from unworthy motives for the sake of appearances, for his own interest, even for the injury of another. A disciplined will necessary to heroic Christian character. Once again, though a disciplined will is not a necessary condition of the Christian life, it is necessary to the development of the heroic Christian character. A Gordon, a Havelock, a Florence Nightingale, a St. Paul could not be other than a person of vigorous will. In this respect, as in all others, Christianity reaches the feeblest souls. There is a wonderful Guido Magdalene in the Louvre with a mouth which has plainly never been set to any resolve for good or ill. A lower face moulded by helpless following of the inclination of the moment. But you look up to the eyes which are raised to meet the gaze of eyes not shown in the picture and the countenance is transfigured. The whole face is aglow with a passion of service, love and self-surrender. All this the divine grace may accomplish in weak, unwilling souls, and then they will do what they can. 
but their power of service is limited by their past. Not so the child of the Christian mother, whose highest desire is to train him for the Christian life. When he wakes to the consciousness of whose he is and whom he serves, she would have him ready for that high service. With every faculty in training, a man of war from his youth above all with an effective will to do and to do of his good pleasure. The sole practical faculty of man. Before we consider how to train this sole practical faculty of man, we must know how the will operates, how it manages the ordering of all that is done and thought in the kingdom of man's soul. Can't you make yourself do what you wish to do, says Guy, in the air of Redcliffe, to poor Charlie Edmonston, who has never been in the habit of making himself do anything. There are those, no doubt, who have not even arrived at wishing, but most of us desire to do well. What we want to know is how to make ourselves do what we desire. And here is the line which divides the effective from the non-effective people, the great from the small, the good from the well-intentioned and respectable. It is in proportion as a man has self-controlling, self-compelling power that he is able to do even of his own pleasure, that he can depend upon himself and to be sure of his own action in emergencies. How the will operates. Now, how does this autocrat of the bosom behave? Is it with a stern thou shalt, thou shalt not, that the subject man is coerced into obedience? By no means. Is it by a plausible show of reasons, mustering of motives? Not this either, since Mr. John Stuart Mill taught us that all that man does or can do with matter is to move one thing to and from another. We need not be surprised if great moral results are brought about by what seem inadequate means. And a little bit of nursery experience will show better than much talking what is possible to the will. A baby falls, gets a bad bump and cries piteously. The experienced nurse does not kiss the place to make it well or show any pity for the child's trouble. That would make matters worse. The more she pities, the more he sobs. She hastens to change his thoughts, so she says she carries him to the window to see the horses, gives him his pet picture book, his dearest toy, and the child pulls himself up in the middle of a sob, though he is really badly hurt. Now this, of the knowing nurse, is precisely the part the will plays toward the man. It is by force of will that a man can change his thoughts, transfer his attention from one subject of thought to another, and that with a shock of mental force of which he is distinctly conscious. And this is enough to save a man and to make a man this power of making himself think only of those things which he has beforehand decided that it is good to think upon. The way of the will incentives. His thoughts are wandering on forbidden pleasures to the hindrance of his work. He pulls himself up and deliberately fixes his attention on those incentives which have most power to make him work. The leisure and pleasure which follow honest labour, the duty which binds him to the fulfilling of his task. His thoughts run in the groove he wills them to run in and work is no longer an effort. Diversion. Again, some slight affront has called up a flood of resentful feeling. So-and-so should not have done it. He had no right. It was mean and so on. Through all the hard things we are ready enough to say in our hearts of an offender against our amour propre. But the man under the control of his own will does not allow this to go on. He does not fight it out with himself and say, this is very wrong in me, so and so is not so much to blame after all. He has not ready for that yet, but he just compels himself to think of something else, 
the last book he has read, the next letter he must write, anything interesting enough to divert his thoughts. When he allows himself to go back to the cause of offence, behold, all rancor is gone and he's able to look at the matter with the coolness of a third person. And this is true not only of the rising of resentment, but of every temptation that besets the flesh and spirit. Change of thought. Again, the sameness of his duties, the weariness of doing the same thing over and over, fills him with disgust and despondency, and he relaxes his efforts. But not if he be a man under the power of his own will, because he simply does not allow himself in idle discontent. It is always within his power to give himself something pleasant, something outside of himself, to think of, and he does so. And given what we call a happy frame of mind, no work is laborious. The way of the will should be taught to children. It is something to know what to do with ourselves when we are beset, and the knowledge of this way of the will is so far the secret of a happy life that it is well worth imparting to the children. Are you cross? Change your thoughts. Are you tired of trying? Change your thoughts. Are you craving for things you are not to have? Change your thoughts. There is power within you, your own will, which will enable you in to turn your attention from thoughts that make you unhappy and wrong to thoughts that make you happy and right. And this is the exceedingly simple way in which the will acts. That is the sole secret of the power over himself which the strong man wields. He can compel himself to think of what he chooses and will not allow himself in thoughts that breed mischief. Power of will implies power of attention. But you perceive that, though the will is all-powerful with certain limits, these are but narrow limits after all. Much must go before and along with a vigorous will if it is to be a power in the ruling of conduct. For instance, the man must have acquired the habit of attention, the great importance of which we have already considered. There are bird-witted people who have no power of thinking connectedly for five minutes under any pressure, from within or from without. If they have never been trained to apply the whole of their mental faculties to a given subject, why, no energy of will, supposing they had it, which is impossible, could make them think steadily thoughts of their own choosing or of anybody else's. Here is how the parts of the intellectual fabric dovetail. Power of will implies power of attention. And before the parent can begin to train the will of the child, he must have begun to form in him the habit of attention. Habit may frustrate the will. Again, we have already considered the fatal faculty in evil, the impulse toward good which habit gives. Habit is either the opponent or the ally too often the frustrator of the will. The unhappy drunkard does will with what strength there is in him. He turns away the eyes of his mind from beholding his snare. He plies himself assiduously with other thoughts, but alas, his thoughts will only run in the accustomed groove of desire and habit is too strong for his feeble will. We all know something of this struggle between habit and will in less vital matters. Who is without some dilatory procrastinating in some way tiresome habit which is in almost daily struggle with the rectified will. But I have already said so much about the duty of parents to ease the way of their children by laying down for them the lines of helpful habits that it is unnecessary to say a word more here of habit as an ally or a hinderer of the will. Reasonable use of so effective an instrument. And once more, only the man of cultivated reason is capable of being ruled by a well-directed will. 
if his understanding does not show good cause why he should do some solid reading every day, why he should cling to the faith of his fathers, why he should take up his duties as a citizen. The movement of his will will be feeble and fluctuating and very barren of results. And indeed worse may happen. He may take up some wrong-headed or even vicious notion and work a great deal of mischief by what he feels to be a virtuous effort of will. The parent may venture to place the power of will in the hands of his child only in so far as he trains him to make a reasonable use of so effective an instrument. How to strengthen the will. One other limitation of the will we shall consider presently. But supposing the parent take pains that the child shall be in a fit state to use his will, how is he to strengthen that will so that by and by the child may employ it to control his own life by? We have spoken already of the importance of training the child in the habit of obedience. Now, obedience is valuable only insofar as it helps the child towards making himself do that which he knows he ought to do. Every effort of obedience which does not give him a sense of conquest over his own inclinations helps to enslave him and he will resent the loss of his liberty by running into license when he can. That is the secret of the miscarrying of many strictly brought up children. But invite his cooperation, let him heartily intend and purpose to do the thing he is bidden and then it is his own will that is compelling him and not yours. He has begun the greatest effort, the highest accomplishment of human life, the making, the compelling of himself. Let him know what he is about. Let him enjoy a sense of triumph and of your congratulation whenever he fetches his thoughts back to his tiresome sum whenever he makes his hand finish what they have begun. Whenever he throws a black dog off his back and produces a smile from a clouded face. Habit of self-management. Then, as was said before, let him know the secret of willing. Let him know that by an effort of will, he can turn his thoughts to the thing he wants to think of, his lessons, his prayers, his work, and away from the things he should not think of. That, in fact, he can be such a brave, strong little fellow, he can make himself think of what he likes, and let him try little experiments, that if he once get his thoughts right, the rest will take care of itself. He will be sure to do right then. That if he feels cross, naughty thoughts coming upon him, the plan is to think hard about something else, something nice, his next birthday, what he means to do when he is man. Not all this at once, of course, but line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, as opportunity offers. Let him get into the habit of managing himself, controlling himself, and it is astonishing how much self-compelling power quite a young child will exhibit. Restrain yourself, Tommy, I once heard a wise aunt say to a boy of four, and Tommy restrained himself, though he was making a terrible hullabaloo about some small trouble. Education of the will more important than that of the intellect. All this time, the will of the child is being both trained and strengthened. He is learning how and when to use his will, and it is becoming every day more vigorous and capable. Let me add one or two wise thoughts from Dr. Morrill's Introduction to Mental Philosophy. The education of the will is really of far greater importance as shaping the destiny of the individual than that of the intellect. Theory and doctrine, the inculcation of laws and propositions, will never of themselves lead to the uniform habit of right action. It is by doing that we learn to do, 
by overcoming, that we learn to overcome. And every right act which we cause to spring out of pure principles, whether by authority, precept or example, will have a greater weight in the formation of character than all the theory in the world. 2. The Conscience Conscience is judge and lawgiver. But the will by no means carries on the government of the king of man's soul single-handed. True, the will wields the executive power. It is only by willing we are enabled to do. But there is a higher power behind, whose mandate the will does no more than express. Conscience sits supreme in the inner chamber. Conscience is the lawgiver and utters the thou shalt and the thou shalt not, whereon the will takes action. The judge too, before whom the offending soul is summoned. And from the thou art the man of conscience, there is no appeal. I am I ought I can I will. I am I ought I can I will. These are the steps of the ladder of St. Augustine, whereby rise on stepping stones of our dead selves to higher things. I am. We have the power of knowing ourselves. I ought. We have within us a moral judge to whom we feel ourselves subject and who points out and requires of us our duty. I can. We are conscious of power to do that which we perceive we ought to do. I will. We determine to exercise that power with a volition which is in itself a step in the execution of that which we will. Here is a beautiful and perfect chain. And the wonder is that so exquisitely constituted as he is for right doing, error should be even possible to man. But of the sorrowful mysteries of sin and temptation, it is not my place to speak here. You will see that it is because of the possibilities of ruin and loss which lie about every human life that I am pressing upon parents the duty of saving their children by the means put into their hands. Perhaps it is not too much to say that 99 out of 100 lost lives lie at the door of parents who took no pains to deliver their children from sloth, from sensual appetites, from willfulness, no pains to fortify them with the habits of a good life. Inertness of parents not supplemented by divine grace. We live in a redeemed world and infinite grace and help from above attend every rightly directed effort in the training of the children. But I do not see much ground for hoping that divine grace will step in as a substitute for any and every power we choose to leave unused or misdirected. In the physical world, we do not expect miracles to make up for our neglect of the use of means. The rickety body, the misshapen limb, for which the child has to thank his parents, remain with him through life however much else he may have to thank God for. And a feeble will, bad habits, an uninstructed conscience stick to many a Christian man through his life because his parents failed in their duty to him and he has not had force enough in himself to supply their omission. Conscience is not an infallible guide. In this matter of conscience, for instance, the laissez-faire habit of his parents is the cause of real wrong and injury to many a child. The parents are thankful to believe that their child is born with a conscience. They hope his conduct may be ruled thereby. And the rest they leave, the child and his conscience may settle it between them. Now this is to suppose either that a fully informed conscience is born into an infant body or that it grows like the hair and the limbs with the growth of the body and is not subject to conditions of spiritual progress proper to itself. In other words, it is to suppose that conscience is an infallible guide, a delusion people cling to in spite of common sense 
and of everyday experience of the wrong-headed things men do from conscientious motives. The vagaries of uninstructed conscience are so familiar as to have given rise to the popular verbs honour among thieves, to strain out the gnat and swallow the camel, point to cases of misguided conscience, while the wish is father to the thought, none is so blind as he who won't see, point to still more common cases in which a man knowingly tricks his conscience into acquiescence. But a real power. Then, if conscience be not an infallible guide, if it pass blindfold by heinous offences and come down heavily upon some mere quibble, tithing mint, rue, and all manner of herbs, and neglecting the weightier matters of the law, if conscience be liable to be bamboozled, persuaded into calling evil good and good evil, when desire is the special pleader before the bar, where is its use, this broken reed? Is this stern lawgiver of the breast no more, after all, than a fiction of the brain? Is your conscience no more than what you happen to think about your own actions and those of other people? On the contrary, these aberrations of conscience are perhaps the strongest proof that it exists as a real power. As Adam Smith has well said, the supreme authority of conscience is felt and tacitly acknowledged by the worst, no less than by the best of men. For even they who have thrown off all hypocrisy with the world are at pains to conceal their real character from their own eyes. That spiritual sense whereby we know good and evil. What conscience is, how far it lies in the feelings, how far in the reason, how far is it independent of both, are obscure questions which it is not necessary for practical purposes to settle. But thus much is evident. That conscience is as essential a part of human nature as are the affections and the reason, and that conscience is that spiritual sense whereby we have knowledge of good and evil. The six-month-old child who cannot yet speak exhibits the workings of conscience. A reproving look will make him drop his eyes and hide his face. But observe, the mother may thus cover him with confusion by way of an experiment when the child is all sweetness and the poor little untutored conscience rises all the same and condemns him on the word of another. Facts like this afford a glimpse of the appalling responsibility that lies upon parents. The child comes into the world with a moral faculty, a delicate organ whereby he discerns the flavour of good and evil, and at the same time has a perception of delight in the good, in himself or others, of loathing and abhorrence of the evil. But poor little child, he is like a navigator who does not know how to box his compass. He is born to love the good and to hate the evil but he has no real knowledge of what is good and what is evil. What intuitions he has, he puts no faith in, but yields himself in simplicity to the steering of others. The wonder that God Almighty can endure so far to leave the very making of an immortal being in the hands of human parents is only matched by the wonder that human parents can accept this divine trust with hardly a thought of its significance. A child's conscience an undeveloped capability rather than a supreme authority. Looking then upon conscience in the child rather as an undeveloped capability than as a supreme authority, the question is, how is this nascent lord of the life to be educated up to its high functions of informing the will and decreeing the conduct? For though the ill-taught conscience may make fatal blunders and a man may carry slaughter among the faithful because his conscience bids, yet 
On the other hand, no man ever attained a godly, righteous and sober life except as how he was ruled by a good conscience. A conscience with not only the capacity to discern good and evil, but trained to perceive the qualities of the two. Many a man may have a great delicacy of taste, which should qualify him for a tea taster, but it is only as he has trained experience in the qualities of teas that his nice taste is valuable to his employers and a source of income to himself. The uninstructed conscience. As with that of the will, so with the education of the conscience. It depends on much that has gone before. Refinement of conscience cannot coexist with ignorance. The untutored savage has his scruples that we cannot enter into. We cannot understand to this day how it was that the horrors of the Indian mutiny arose from the mere suspicion that a mixture of hog's lard and beef fat had been used to grease the cartridges dealt out to the sepoys. Those scruples, which are beyond the range of our ideas, we call superstitions and prejudices, and are unwilling to look upon conduct as conscientious, even when prompted by the uninstructed conscience, unless insofar as it is reasonable and right in itself. The processes implied in a conscientious decision. Therefore, it is plain that before conscience is in a position to pronounce its verdict on the facts of a given case, the cultivated reason must review the pros and cons. The practice judgment must balance these, deciding which have the greater weight. Attention must bring all the powers of the mind to bear on the question. Habits of right action must carry the feelings, must make right doing seem the easier and the pleasanter. In the meantime, desire is clamorous, but conscience, the unbiased judge, duly informed in full court of the merits of the case, decides for the right. The will carries out the verdict of conscience, and the man whose conduct is uniformly moulded upon the verdicts of conscience is the conscientious man, of whose actions and opinions you may be sure beforehand. But life is not long enough for such lengthy process. A thousand things have been decided offhand. And then what becomes of these elaborate proceedings? That is just the advantage of an instructed conscience backed by a trained intelligence. The judge is always sitting, the counsel always on the spot. The instructed conscience nearly always right. Here is indeed a high motive for the all-round training of the child's intelligence. He wants the highest culture you can give him backed by carefully formed habits in order that he may have a conscience always alert, supported by every power of the mind. And such a conscience is the very flower of a noble life. The instructed conscience may claim to be, if not infallible, at any rate nearly always right. It is not generally mature until the man is mature. Young people, however right-minded and earnest, are apt to error, chiefly because they fix their attention too much upon some one duty, some one theory of life, at the expense of much besides. The good conscience of a child. But even the child, with the growing conscience and the growing power, is able to say, it would not be right. Yes, I will, for it is right. And once able to give either of these answers to the solicitations that assail him, the child is able to live. For the rest, the development and what may be called the adjustment of conscience will keep pace with his intellectual growth. But allowing that a great deal of various discipline must go to secure that final efflorescence of a good conscience, what is to be done by way of training the conscience itself, quickening the spiritual taste so that the least soupcon of evil is detected and rejected? 
Children play with moral questions. There is no part of education more nice and delicate than this, nor any in which grown-up people are more apt to blunder. Everyone knows how tiresome it is to discuss any nice moral question with children. How they quibble, suggest a hundred ingenious explanations or evasions, fail to be shocked or to admire in the right place. In fact, play with the whole question, or what is more tiresome still, are severe and righteous overmuch, and deal damnation round with much heartiness and goodwill. Sensible parents are often distressed at this want of conscience in children, but they are not greatly in fault. The mature conscience demands to be backed up by the mature intellect, and the children have neither the one or the other. Discussions of the kind should be put down. The children should not be encouraged to give their opinions on questions of right and wrong. And little books should not be put into their hands which pronounce authoritatively upon conduct. The Bible, the chief source of moral ideas. It would be well if the reticence of the Bible in this respect were observed by the writers of children's books whether of story or history. The child hears the history of Joseph, with reservations, read from the Bible, which rarely offers comment or explanation. He does not need to be told what was naughty and what was good. There was no need to press home the teaching, or the Bible were written in vain, and good and bad actions carry no witness with them. Let all the circumstances of the daily Bible reading, the consecutive reading from the first chapter of Genesis onwards, with necessary omissions, be delightful to the child. Let him be in his mother's room, in his mother's arms. Let that quarter of an hour be one of sweet leisure and sober gladness. The child's whole interest being allowed to go to the story without distracting moral considerations. And then, the less talk the better. The story will sink in and bring its own teaching. A little now and more every year as he is able to bear it. One such story will be in him a constantly growing, fructifying moral idea. Tales fix attention upon conduct. The Bible, the fitting parts of it, that is, first and supreme, but any true picture of life, whether a tale of golden deeds or of faulty and struggling human life, brings ailment to the growing conscience. The child gets into the habit of fixing his attention on conduct. Actions are weighed by him, at first, by their consequences, but by degrees his conscience acquires discriminating power. And such and such behaviour is bad or good to him, whatever its consequences. And this silent growth of the moral faculty takes place all the more surely if the distraction of chatter on the subject is avoided. For a thousand small movements of vanity and curiosity and mere love of talk are easily called into play. And these take off the attention from the moral idea which should be conveyed to the conscience. It is very important, again, that the child should not be allowed to condemn the conduct of the people about him. Whether he is right or wrong in his verdict is not the question. The habit of bestowing blame will certainly blunt his conscience, deaden his sensibility to the injunction, judge not that ye be not judged. Ignorance of a child's conscience. But the child's own conduct, surely he may be called to look into that? His conduct, including his words, yes, but his motives, no. Nothing must be done to induce the evil habit of introspection. Also, in setting the child to consider his ways, regard must be had to the extreme ignorance of the child's conscience. A degree of ignorance puzzling to grown-up people when they chance to discover it, 
which is not often, for the children, notwithstanding their endless chatter and their friendly, loving ways, live very much to themselves. They commit serious offences against truth, modesty, love, and do not know that they have done wrong, while some absurd featherweight of transgression oppresses their souls. Children will bite and hurt one another viciously, commit petty thefts, do such shocking things that their parents fear they must have very bad natures. It is not necessarily so. It is simply that the untaught conscience sees no clear boundary line between right and wrong and is as apt to error on the one side as the other. I once saw a dying child of 12 who was wearing herself out with great distress because she feared she had committed the unpardonable sin. So she said, how she picked up the phrase nobody knew. And that was that she had been saying her prayers without even kneeling up in bed. The ignorance of children about the commonest matters of right and wrong is really pathetic. And yet, they are too often treated as if they knew all about it because they have consciences, as if conscience were any more than a spiritual organ waiting for direction. Instructing the conscience, kindness. That the children do wrong knowingly is another matter and requires, alas, no proving. All I am pressing for is the real need there exists to instruct them in their duty, and this not at haphazard, but regularly and progressively. Kindness, for instance, is, let us say, the subject of instruction this week. There is one of the talks with their mother that the children love. A short talk is best about kindness. Kindness is love, showing itself in act and word look and manner. A well of love shut up and hidden in a little boy's heart does not do anybody much good. The love must bubble up as a spring, flow out in a stream, and then it is kindness. Then will follow short daily talks about kind ways to brothers and sisters, to playmates, to parents, to grown-up friends, to servants, to people in pain and trouble, to dumb creatures, to people we do not see but yet can think about, in all distress, the heathen. Give the children one thought at a time, and every time some lovely example of loving kindness that will fire their hearts with the desire to do likewise. Take our Lord's parable of the Good Samaritan for a model of instruction in morals. Let tale and talk make the children emulous of virtue and then give them the go and do likewise, the law. Having presented to them the idea of kindness in many aspects and with the law, be kind or be kindly affectioned one to another. Let them know that this is the law of God for children and for grown-up people. Now conscience is instructed. The feelings are enlisted on the side of duty. And if the child is brought up, it is for breaking the law of kindness, a law that he knows of, that his conscience convicts him in the breaking. Do not give children deterrent examples of error because of the sad proclivities of human nature. But always tell them of beautiful golden deeds, small and great, that shall stir them as trumpet calls to the battle of life. The conscience made effective by discipline. Be courteous, be candid, be grateful, be considerate, be true. There are aspects of duty enough to occupy the attention of mother and child for every day of the child life. And all the time, the idea of duty is being formed and conscience is being educated and developed. At the same time, the mother exercises a friendly vigilance of a guardian angel being watchful 
not to catch the child tripping, but to guide him into the acting out of the duty she has already made lovingly in his eyes. For it is only as we do that we learn to do and become strong in the doing. As she instructs her child in duty, she teaches him to listen to the voice of conscience as to the voice of God, a do this or do it not within the breast to be obeyed with full assurance. It is objected that we are making infallible, not the divinely implanted conscience, but that same conscience made effective by discipline. It is even so in every department of life, physical or spiritual, human effort appears to be the condition of the divine energizing. There must be a stretching forth of the withered arm before it receives strength. And we have every reason to believe that the instructed conscience being faithfully followed is divinely illuminated. Three, the divine life in the child. The very pulse of the machine. It is evident we have not yet reached the very pulse of the machine. Habits, feelings, reason, conscience. We have followed these into the inmost recesses of the child's life. Each acts upon the other. But what acts upon the last? What acts upon them all? It is, says a writer who has searched into the deep things of God, it is a king that our spirits cry for to guide them, discipline them, unite them to each other, to give them a victory over themselves, a victory over the world. It is a priest that our spirits cry out for, to lift them above themselves to their God and Father, to make them partakers of his nature, fellow workers in carrying out his purposes. Christ's sacrifice is the one authentic testimony that he is both the priest and king of men. Parents have some power to enthrone the king. Conscience, we have seen, is effective only as it is moved from within, from that innermost chamber of man's soul, that holy of holies, the secrets of which are only known to the high priest who needed not that any man should tell him, for he knew what was in man. It is necessary, however, that we should gather up crumbs of fact and interference and set in order such knowledge as we have. For the keys even of this innermost chamber are placed in the hands of parents, and it is a great deal in their power to enthrone the king, to induct the priest, that every human spirit cries for. The functions and life of the soul. We take it for granted in common speech that every soul is a living soul, a fully developed, fully grown soul. But the language of the Bible and that of general experience seem to point to startling conclusions. It has been said of a great poet with how much justice it is not the question here, that if we could suppose any human being to be made without a soul, he was such an abortive attempt. For while he had a reason, imagination, passions, all the appetites and desires of an intelligent being, he appeared to exercise not one of the functions of the soul. Now, what are these functions, the suspension of which calls the very existence of a man's soul in question? We must go back to the axiom of Augustine. The soul of man is for God, as God is for the soul. The soul has one appetite for the things of God, breathes one air. The breath, the spirit of God, has one desire for the knowledge of God. One only joy in the face of God. I want to live in the light of a countenance which never ceases to smile upon me is the language of the soul. The direct action of the soul is all Godward with a reflex action towards men. The speech of the soul is prayer and praise. The right hand of the soul is faith. The light of the soul is love. The love of God shed abroad upon it. 
Observe these are the functions, this, the life of the soul, the only functions, the only life it can have. If it have not these, it has no power to turn aside and find the life of its hand elsewhere. As the conscience, the will, the reason is ineffective till it be nourished with its proper food, exercised in its proper functions, so of the soul. And its chamber is dull with cobwebbed doors and clouded windows until it awake to its proper food. Not quite empty though, for there is the nascent soul and the awakening into life takes place. Sometimes with a sudden shock, the gracious miracle, which we call conversion. Sometimes when the parents so will, the soul of the child expands with a gentle, sweet growth and gradual unfolding as of a flower. There are torpid souls which are yet alive. There are feeble, sickly souls which are yet alive. And there are souls which no movement Godward ever quickens. What is the life of the soul? This life of the soul, what is it? Communicated life as when one lights a torch at the fire? Perhaps, but it is something more intimate, more unspeakable. I am the life. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Abide in me and I in you. The truth is too ineffable to be uttered in any words but those given to us. But it means this, at least, that the living soul does not abide alone in its place. That place becomes the temple of the living God. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. How dreadful is this place! The parent must present the idea of God to the soul of the child. But this holy mystery, this union and communion of God and the soul, how may human parents presume to meddle with it? What can they do? How can they promote it? And is there not every risk that they may lay rude hands upon the ark? In the first place, it does not rest with the parent to choose whether he will or will not attempt to quicken or nourish this divine life in his child. To do so is his bounden duty and service. If he neglect or fail in this, I am not sure how much it matters that he has fulfilled his duties in the physical, moral and mental culture of his child, except insofar as the child is the fitter for the divine service should the divine life be awakened in him. But what can the parent do? Just this and no more, he can present the idea of God to the soul of the child. Here, as throughout his universe, Almighty God works by apparently inadequate means. Who would say that a bee can produce apple trees? Yet a bee flies from an apple tree laden with the pollen of its flowers. This it unwittingly deposits on the stigmas of the flowers of the next tree it comes to. The bee goes, but the pollen remains, but with all the length of the style between it and the immature ovule below. That does not matter. The ovule has no power to reach the pollen grain, but the latter sends forth a slender tube within the tube of the style. The ovule is reached. Behold then the fruit with its seed and, if you like, future apple trees. Accept the parable. The parent is little better in this matter than the witless bee. It is his part to deposit, so to speak, within reach of the soul of the child some fruitful idea of God. The immature soul makes no effort toward that idea, but the living word reaches down, touches the soul, and there is life, growth, beauty, flower and fruit must not make blundering efforts. 
I venture to ask you to look for once at these divine mysteries from the same philosophical standpoint we have taken up in regarding all the capabilities and functions of the child, partly because it is instructive to see how the mysteries of the religious life appear when it is looked at from without its own sphere. Partly because I wish to rise by unbroken steps to the supreme function of the parent in the education of his child. For here the similitude of the bee and the apple tree fails. The parent must not make blundering, witless efforts. As this is the highest duty imposed upon him, it is also the most delicate. And he will have infinite need of faith and prayer, tact and discretion, humility, gentleness, love and sound judgment if he would present his child to God and the thought of God to the soul of his child. God presented to children as an exactor and a punisher. If we think of God as an exactor and not a giver, it has been well said, exactors and not givers shall we become. Yet is not this the light in which God is most commonly set before the children? A pharaoh demanding his tale of bricks, bricks of good behaviour and right doing? Do not parents deliberately present God as an exactor to back up the feebleness of their own government? And do they not freely utter on the part of God threats they would be unwilling to utter on their own part? Again, what child has not heard from his nurse this, delivered with much energy? God does not love you, you naughty boy. He will send you to the bad place. And these two thoughts of God, as an exactor and a punisher, make up often enough all the idea the poor child gets of his father in heaven. What fruit can come of this but aversion? the turning away of the child from the face of his father? What if, instead, were given to him the thought well expressed in the words, the all-forgiving gentleness of God? Parents must select inspiring ideas. These are but two of many deterring thoughts of God commonly presented to the tender soul. And the mother who realises that the heart of her child may be irrevocably turned against God by the ideas of him imbibed in the nursery will feel the necessity for grave and careful thought and definite resolve as to what teaching her child shall receive on this momentous subject. She will most likely forbid any mention of the divine name to the children except by their parents explaining at the same time that she does so because she cares so much that her children should not get none but the right thoughts on this great matter. It is better that children should receive a few vital ideas that their souls may grow upon than a great deal of indefinite teaching. We must teach only what we know. How to select these few quickening thoughts of the infinite God? The selection is not so difficult to make as would appear at first sight. In the first place, we must teach that which we know, know by the life of the soul, not with any mere knowledge of the mind. Now, of the vast mass of the doctrines and the precepts of religion, we shall find that there are only a few vital truths that we have so taken into our being that we live upon them. This person, these, that person, those. Some of us, not more than a single one. One or more, these are the truths we must teach the children because these will come straight out of our hearts with the enthusiasm of conviction which rarely fails to carry its own idea into the spiritual life of another. There is no more fruitful source of which it is hardly too much to call infant infidelity than the unreal dead words which are poured upon children about the best things with an artificial solemnity of tone and manner intended to make up for the want of living meaning in the words. 
Let the parent who only knows one thing from above teach his child that one. More will come to him by the time the child is ready for more. Fitting and vital ideas. Again, there are some ideas of the spiritual life more proper than others to the life and needs of the child. Thus Christ, the joy giver, is more to him than Christ, the consoler. And there are some few ideas which are as the daily bread of the soul, without which life and growth are impossible. All other teaching may be deferred until the child's need bring him to it. But whoever sends his child out into life without these vital ideas of spiritual life sends him forth with a dormant soul, however well instructed he may be in theology. The knowledge of God distinct from morality. Again, the knowledge of God is distinct from morality on what the children call being good though being good follows from that knowledge. But let these come in their right order. Do not bepreach the child to weariness about being good as what he owes to God without letting in upon him first a little of that knowledge which shall make him good. We are no longer suffering from an embarrassment of riches. These limitations shut out so much of the ordinary teaching about divine things that the question becomes rather, what shall we teach than how shall we choose? The times and the manner of religious instruction. The next consideration that will press upon the mother are of the times and the manner of this teaching in the things of God. It is better that these teachings be rare and precious than too frequent and slightly valued. Better not at all than that the child should be surfeited with mere sight of spiritual food, rudely served. At the same time, he must be built up in the faith and his lessons must be regular and progressive. And here everything depends upon the tact of the mother. Spiritual teaching like the wafted odour of flowers, should depend on which way the wind blows. Every now and then there occurs a holy moment, felt to be holy by mother and child, when the two are together. That is the moment for some deeply felt and softly spoken word about God, such as the occasion gives rise to. Few words need to be said, no exhortation at all, just the flash of conviction from the soul of the mother to the soul of the child. Is our father the thought thus laid upon the child's soul? There will be perhaps no more than a sympathetic meeting of eyes hereafter between mother and child over a thousand showings forth of our father's love. But the idea is growing, becoming part of the child's spiritual life. That is all no routine of spiritual teaching, a dread of many words which are apt to smother the fire of sacred life, much self-restraint shown in the allowing of seeming opportunities to pass, and all the time earnest purpose of heart and a definite scheme for the building up of the child in the faith. It need not be added that to make another use of our Lord's words, this kind cometh forth only by prayer. It is as the mother gets wisdom liberally from above that she will be enabled for this task. The reading of the Bible. A word about the reading of the Bible. I think we make a mistake of burying in the text under our endless comments and applications. Also, I doubt if the picking out of individual verses and grinding these into the child until they cease to have any meaning for him is anything but a hindrance to the spiritual life. The word is full of vital force, capable of applying itself. A seed, light as thistledown, wafted into the child's soul, will take root downwards and bear fruit upwards. What is required of us is that we should implant a love for the word 
that the most delightful moments of the child's day should be those in which his mother reads for him with sweet sympathy and holy gladness in voice and eyes the beautiful stories of the Bible. And now and then in the reading will occur one of those convictions passing from the soul of the mother to the soul of the child in which is the life of the spirit. Let the child grow so that new thoughts of God, new hopes of heaven are a joy to him too. Things to be counted first among the blessings of a day. Above all, do not read the Bible at the child. Do not let any words of scriptures be occasions for gibbeting his faults. It is the office of the Holy Ghost to convince of sin, and he is able to use the word for this purpose, without risk of that hardening of the heart in which our clumsy dealings too often result. The matters for this divine teaching will come out of every mother's own convictions. I will attempt to speak of only one or two of those vital truths on which the spiritual life must sustain itself. Father and Giver Our Father, who is in heaven, is perhaps the first idea of God which the mother will present to her child. Father and Giver, straight from whom comes all the gladness of every day. What a happy birthday our Father has given to my little boy. The flowers are coming again. Our Father has taken care of the life of the plants all through the winter cold. Listen to that skylark. It is a wonder how our Father can put so much joy into the heart of one little bird. Thank you God for making my little girl so happy and merry. Out of this thought comes prayer, the free utterance of the child's heart, more often in thanks for the little joys of the day counted up than in desire just yet. The words do not matter. Any simple form the child can understand will do. The rising Godward of the child heart is the true prayer. Out of this thought too comes duty. The glad acknowledgement of the debt of service and obedience to a parent so gracious and benign, not one who exacts service at the sword's point, as it were, but one whom his children run to obey. The essence of Christianity is loyalty to a person. Christ our King. Here is a thought to unseal the fountains of love and loyalty, the treasures of faith and imagination bound up in the child. The very essence of Christianity is personal loyalty, passionate loyalty to our adorable chief. We have laid other foundations, regeneration, sacraments, justification, works, faith, the Bible, any one of which, however necessary to salvation in its due place and proportion, may become a religion about Christ and without Christ. And now a time of sifting has come upon us, and thoughtful people decline to know anything about our religious systems. They write down all our orthodox beliefs as things not knowable. Perhaps this may be because, in thinking much of our salvation, we have put out of sight our king, the divine fact which no soul of man to whom it is presented can ignore. In the idea of Christ is life. Let the thought of him once get touch of the soul, and it rises up a living power, independent of all formularies of the brain. Let us save Christianity for our children by bringing them into allegiance to Christ the King. How? How did old cavaliers bring up sons and daughters in passionate loyalty and reverence for not too worthy princes? Their own hearts were full of it. Their lips spake it. Their acts proclaimed it. The style of their clothes, the ring of their voices, the carriage of their heads, all was one proclamation of boundless devotion to their king and his cause. That civil war, whatever else it did, in missing doing, left a parable for Christian people. If a Stuart prince could command such measure of loyalty, what shall we say of the chief among 10,000 
the altogether lovely. Jesus, our Saviour, here is a thought to be brought tenderly before the child in the moments of misery that follow wrongdoing. My poor little boy, you have been very naughty today. Could you not help it? No, mother, with sobs. No, I suppose not. But there is a way of help. And then the mother tells her child how the Lord Jesus is our saviour because he saves us from our sins. It is a matter of question when the child should first learn the story of the cross. One thinks it would be very delightful to begin with Moses and the prophets to go through the Old Testament history tracing the gradual unfolding of the work and character of the Messiah. And then, when their minds are full of the expectation of the Jews, to bring before them the mystery of the birth in Bethlehem, the humiliation of the cross. But perhaps no gain in freshness of presentation would make up to the child for not having grown up with the associations of Calvary and Bethlehem always present in their minds. One thing in this connection, it is not well to allow the children in a careless familiarity with the name of Jesus or in the use of hymns whose tone is not reverent. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. The indwelling of Christ is a thought particularly fit for the children, because their large faith does not stumble at the mystery. Their imagination leaps readily to the marvel that the King himself should inhabit a little child's heart. How am I to know he is come, Mother? When you are quite gentle, sweet and happy, it is because Christ is within. And when he comes, he makes your face so fair, your friends are glad and say, the king is there. I will not attempt to indicate any more of the vital truths which the Christian mother will present to her child. Having patience until they blossom and bear, and his soul is as a very fruitful garden which the Lord hath blessed. But once more, this kind cometh forth only by prayer. End of Home Education by Charlotte Mason Excluding the Appendix